Chapter 15 In which Howl goes to a funeral in disguise The dog man curled up heavily on Sophie's toes when she went back to her sewing. Perhaps he was hoping she would manage to lift the spell if he stayed close to her. When a big red-bearded man burst into the room carrying a box of things and shed his velvet cloak to become Michael, still carrying a box of things, the dog man rose up and wagged his tail. He let Michael pat him and rub his ears. I hope he stays, Michael said. I've always wanted a dog. Howl heard Michael's voice. He arrived downstairs wrapped in the brown patchwork cover off his bed. Sophie stopped sewing and took a careful grip on the dog, but the dog was courteous to Howl, too. He did not object when Howl fetched a hand out of the coverlet and patted him. Well, Howl croaked, dispersing clouds of dust as he conjured some more tissues. I got everything, said Michael, and there's a real piece of luck, Howl. There's an empty shop for sale down in Market Chipping. It used to be a hat shop. Do you think we could move the castle there? Hal sat on a tall stool like a robed Roman senator and considered. It depends how much it costs, he said. I'm quite tempted to move the Port Haven entrance there. That won't be easy because it will mean moving Calcifer. Port Haven is where Calcifer actually is. What do you say, Calcifer? It will take a very careful operation to move me, Calcifer said. He had become several shades paler at the thought. I think you should leave me where I am. So Fanny is selling the shop, Sophie thought, as the other three went on discussing the move. And so much for the conscience Hal said he had. But the main thing on her mind was the puzzling behaviour of the dog. In spite of Sophie telling him many times that she could not take the spell off him, he did not seem to want to leave. He did not want to bite Howl. He let Michael take him for a run on Port Haven marshes that night and the following morning. His aim seemed to be to become part of the household. Though if I were you, I'd be in upper folding making sure to catch Letty on the rebound, Sophie told him. Hal was in and out of bed all the next day. When he was in bed, Michael had to tear up and down the stairs. When he was up, Michael had to race about, measuring the castle with him and fixing metal brackets to every single corner. In between, Hal kept appearing, robed in his quilt and clouds of dust, to ask questions and make announcements, mostly for Sophie's benefit. Sophie! Since you whitewashed over all the marks we made when we invented the castle, perhaps you can tell me where the marks in Michael's room were. No, said Sophie, sewing in her seventieth blue triangle. I can't. Hal sneezed sadly and retired. Shortly, he emerged again. Sophie, if we were to take that hat shop, what would we sell? Sophie found she'd had enough of hats to last a lifetime. Not hats, she said. You can buy the shop, but not the business, you know. Apply your fiendish mind to the matter, said Howell, or even think if you know how. And he marched away upstairs again. Five minutes later down he came again. Sophie, have you any preferences about the other entrances? Where would you like us to live? Sophie instantly found her mind going to Mrs. Fairfax's house. I'd like a nice house with lots of flowers, she said. I see, croaked Howl and marched away again. Next time he appeared, he was dressed. That made three times that day and Sophie thought nothing of it until Howl put on the velvet cloak Michael had used and became a pale, coughing, red-bearded man with a large red handkerchief held to his nose. She realized Hal was going out then. You'll make your cold worse, she said. I shall die, and then you'll all be sorry, the red-bearded man said, and went out through the door with the knob green down. For an hour after that, Michael had time to work on his spell. Sophie got as far as her eighty-fourth blue triangle. Then the red-bearded man was back again. 
He shed the velvet cloak and became Howl, coughing harder than before, and, if that was possible, more sorry for himself than ever. I took the shop, he told Michael. It's got a useful shed at the back and a house at the side, and I took the lot. I'm not sure what I shall pay for it all with, though. What about the money you get if you find Prince Justin? Michael asked. You forget, croaked Howl. The whole object of this operation is not to look for Prince Justin. We are going to vanish. And he went coughing upstairs to bed, where he shortly began shaking the beams, sneezing for attention again. Michael had to leave the spell and rush upstairs. Sophie might have gone, except the dog-man got in the way when she tried. This was another part of his odd behaviour. He did not like Sophie to do anything for Hal. Sophie felt this was fairly reasonable. She began on her eighty-fifth triangle. Michael came cheerfully down and worked on his spell again. He was so happy that he was joining in Calcifer's saucepan song and chatting to the skull just as Sophie did while he worked. We're going to live in market chipping, he told the skull. I can go and see my Letty every day. Is that why you told Howl about the shop? Sophie asked, threading her needle. By this time she was on her eighty-ninth triangle. Yes, Michael said happily. Letty told me about it when we were wondering how we'd ever see one another again. I told her... He was interrupted by Howl, trailing downstairs in his quilt again. This is positively my last appearance, Hal croaked. I forgot to say that Mrs. Pentstemon is being buried tomorrow on her estate near Porthaven, and I shall need the suit cleaned. He brought the grey and scarlet suit out from inside his coverlet and dropped it on Sophie's lap. You're attending to the wrong suit, he told Sophie. This is the one I like, but I haven't the energy to clean it myself. You don't need to go to the funeral, do you? Michael said anxiously. I wouldn't dream of staying away, said Howl. Mrs. Pence Stemmon made me the wizard I am. I have to pay my respects. But your cold's worse, said Michael. He's made it worse, said Sophie, by getting up and chasing around. Howl at once put on his noblest expression. I'll be all right, he croaked, as long as I keep out of the sea wind. It's a bitter place, the Pentstemon estate. The trees are all bent sideways, and there's no shelter for miles. Sophie knew he was just playing for sympathy. She snorted. And what about the witch? Michael asked. How coughed piteously. I shall go in disguise, probably as another corpse, he said, trailing back toward the stairs. Then you need a winding sheet and not this suit, Sophie called after him. Hal trailed away upstairs without answering, and Sophie did not protest. She now had the charmed suit in her hands, and it was too good a chance to miss. She took up her scissors and hacked the grey and scarlet suit into seven jagged pieces. That ought to discourage Hal from wearing it. Then she got to work on the last triangles of the blue and silver suit, mostly little fragments from round the neck. It was now very small indeed. It looked as if it might be a size too small even for Mrs. Pence Stemmon's page boy. Michael, she said, hurry up with that spell. It's urgent. I won't be long now, Michael said. Half an hour later, he checked things off on his list and said he thought he was ready. He came over to Sophie, carrying a tiny bowl with a very small amount of green powder in the bottom. Where do you want it? Here, said Sophie, snipping off the last threads. She pushed the sleeping dog man aside and laid the child-sized suit carefully on the floor. Michael, quite as carefully, tipped the bowl and sprinkled powder on every inch of it. Then they both waited, rather anxiously. A moment passed. Michael sighed with relief. The suit was gently spreading out larger. They watched it spread, and spread, 
until one side of it piled up against the dogman, and Sophie had to pull it further away to give it room. After about five minutes, they both agreed that the suit looked Hal's size again. Michael gathered it up and carefully shook the excess powder off into the grate. Carcifer flared and snarled. The dogman jumped in his sleep. Watch it, said Carcifer. That was strong. Sophie took the suit and hobbled upstairs on tiptoe with it. Hal was asleep on his grey pillows, with his spiders busily making new webs around him. He looked noble and sad in his sleep. Sophie hobbled to put the blue and silver suit on the old chest by the window, trying to tell herself that the suit had got no larger since she picked it up. Still, if it stops you going to the funeral, that's no loss, she murmured as she took a look out of the window. The sun was low across the neat garden. A large dark man was out there, enthusiastically throwing a red ball toward Hal's nephew, Neil, who was standing with a look of patient suffering holding a bat. Sophie could see the man was Neil's father. Snooping again, Hal said suddenly behind her. Sophie swung round guiltily to find that Hal was only half awake, really. He may even have thought it was the day before, because he said, Teach me to keep off envy's stinging. That's all part of past years now. I love Wales, but it doesn't love me. Megan's full of envy because she's respectable and I'm not. Then he woke up a little more and asked, What are you doing? Just putting out your suit for you, Sophie said, and hobbled hastily away. Hal must have gone back to sleep. He did not emerge again that night. There was no sign of him stirring when Sophie and Michael got up next morning. They were careful not to disturb him. Neither of them felt that going to Mrs. Pentstemon's funeral was a good idea. Michael crept out on the hills to take the dogman for a run. Sophie tiptoed about, getting breakfast, hoping Hal would oversleep. There was still no sign of how when Michael came back. The dog man was starving hungry. Sophie and Michael were hunting in the closet for things a dog could eat when they heard Hal coming slowly downstairs. Sophie! Hal's voice said accusingly. He was standing holding the door to the stairs open with an arm that was entirely hidden inside an immense blue and silver sleeve. His feet, on the bottom stair, were standing inside the top half of a gigantic blue and silver jacket. Howell's other arm did not come anywhere near the other huge sleeve. Sophie could see that arm in outline, making bulging gestures under a vast frill of collar. Behind Howell, the stairs were full of blue and silver suit, trailing back all the way to his bedroom. Oh, dear, said Michael. Howl, it was my fault, I... Your fault? Garbage, said Howl. I can detect Sophie's hand a mile off, and there are several miles of this suit. Sophie, dear, where is my other suit? Sophie hurriedly fetched the pieces of the grey and scarlet suit out of the broom cupboard where she had hidden them. Howl surveyed them. Well, that's something he said. I'd been expecting it to be too small to see. Give it here, all seven of it. Sophie held the bundle of grey and scarlet cloth out toward him. Hal, with a bit of searching, succeeded in finding his hand inside the multiple folds of blue and silver sleeve and working it through a gap between two tremendous stitches. He grabbed the bundle off her. I am now, he said. "'Going to get ready for the funeral. "'Please, both of you refrain from doing anything whatsoever while I do. "'I can tell Sophie is in top form at the moment, "'and I want this room the usual size when I come back into it.' "'He set off with dignity to the bathroom, "'wading in blue and silver suit. "'The rest of the blue and silver suit followed him, "'dragging step by step down the stairs and rustling across the floor.' By the time Howe was in the bathroom, 
Most of the jacket was on the ground floor, and the trousers were appearing on the stairs. Howl half shut the bathroom door and seemed to go on hauling the suit in, hand over hand. Sophie and Michael and the dog man stood and watched yard after yard of blue or silver fabric proceed across the floor, decorated with an occasional silver button the size of a millstone and enormous regular rope-like stitches. There may have been nearly a mile of it. I don't think I got that spell quite right, Michael said when the last huge scalloped edge had disappeared round the bathroom door. And didn't he let you know it, said Calcifer. Another log, please. Michael gave Calcifer a log. Sophie fed the dog man. But neither of them dared do anything much else except stand around eating bread and honey for breakfast until Howl came out of the bathroom. He came forth two hours later, out of a steam of verbena-scented spells. He was all in black. His suit was black, his boots were black, and his hair was black too, the same blue raven black as Miss Angorian's. His earring was a long jet pendant. Sophie wondered if the black hair was in honour of Mrs. Pentstemon. She agreed with Mrs. Pentstemon that black hair suited Hal. His green glass eyes went better with it. But she wondered very much which suit the black one really was. Hal conjured himself a black tissue and blew his nose on it. The window rattled. He picked up one of the slices of bread and honey from the bench and beckoned the dog man. The dog man looked dubious. I only want you where I can look at you, Hal croaked. His cold was still bad. Come here, Pooch. As the dog crawled reluctantly into the middle of the room, Hal added, You won't find my other suit in the bathroom, Mrs. Snoop. You're not getting your hands on any of my clothes again. Sophie stopped tiptoeing toward the bathroom and watched Hal walk round the dog man, eating bread and honey and blowing his nose by turns. What do you think of this as a disguise? he said. He flicked the black tissue at Calcifer and started to fall forward onto hands and knees. Almost as he started to move, he was gone. By the time he touched the floor, he was a curly red setter, just like the dog man. The dog man was taken completely by surprise, and his instincts got the better of him. His hackles came up, his ears lowered, and he growled. Howl played up, or else he felt the same. The two identical dogs walked round one another, glaring, growling, bristling, and getting ready to fight. Sophie caught the tail of the one she thought was the dog man. Michael grabbed for the one he thought was Howl. Howl rather hastily turned himself back. Sophie found a tall black person standing up in front of her and let go of the back of Hal's jacket. The dog man sat down on Michael's feet, staring tragically. Good, said Hal. If I can deceive another dog, I can fool everyone else. No one at the funeral is going to notice a stray dog lifting its leg against the gravestones. He went to the door and turned the knob blue down. Wait a moment, said Sophie. If you're going to the funeral as a red setter, why take all the trouble of getting yourself up in black? Howe lifted his chin and looked noble. Respect to Mrs. Pentstemon, he said, opening the door. She liked one to think of all the details. He went out into the street of Port Haven. Chapter 16, in which there is a great deal of witchcraft. Several hours passed. The dog man was hungry again. Michael and Sophie decided to have lunch too. Sophie approached Calcifer with the frying pan. Why can't you have bread and cheese for once? Calcifer grumbled. All the same, he bent his head. Sophie was just putting the pan on top of the curly green flames when Howl's voice rang out hoarsely from nowhere. Brace yourself, Carcifer! She's found me! Carcifer sprang upright. The frying pan fell across Sophie's knees. You'll have to wait! 
Carlsifer roared, flaming blindingly up the chimney. Almost at once he blurred into a dozen or so burning blue faces, as if he was being shaken violently about and burned with a loud, throaty whirring. That must mean they're fighting, Michael whispered. Sophie sucked a slightly burned finger and picked slices of bacon off her skirt with the other hand, staring at Carlsifer. He was whipping from side to side of the fireplace. His blurred faces pulsed from deep blue to sky blue and then almost to white. One moment he had multiple orange eyes, the next rose of starry silver ones. She had never imagined anything like it. Something swept overhead with a blast and a boom which shook everything in the room. A second something followed with a long shrill roar. Calcifer pulsed nearly blue-black and Sophie's skin fizzed with the back blast from the magic. Michael scrambled for the window. They're quite near. Sophie hobbled to the window too. The storm of magic seemed to have affected half the things in the room. The skull was yattering its jaw so hard that it was travelling round in circles. Packets were jumping, powder was seething in jars. A book dropped heavily out of the shelves and lay open on the floor, fanning its pages back and forth. At one end of the room, scented steam boiled out of the bathroom. At the other end, Howell's guitar made out-of-tune twangings, and Calcifer whipped about harder than ever. Michael put the skull in the sink to stop it from yattering itself onto the floor while he opened the window and craned out. Whatever was happening was maddeningly just out of sight. People in the houses opposite were at doors and windows, pointing to something more or less overhead. Sophie and Michael ran to the broom cupboard where they seized a velvet cloak each and flung them on. Sophie got the one that turned its wearer into a red-bearded man. Now she knew why Calcifer had laughed at her in the other one, Michael was a horse. But there was no time to laugh just then. Sophie dragged the door open and sped into the street, followed by the dogman, who seemed surprisingly calm about the whole thing. Michael trotted out after her with a clatter of non-existent hooves, leaving Calcifer whipping from blue to white behind them. The street was full of people looking upward. No one had time to notice things like horses coming out of houses. Sophie and Michael looked too, and found a huge cloud boiling and twisting just above the chimney tops. It was black and rotating on itself violently. White flashes that were not quite like light stabbed through the murk of it. But almost as soon as Michael and Sophie arrived, the clot of magic took on the shape of a misty bundle of fighting snakes. Then it tore in two, with a noise like an enormous cat fight. One part sped yowling across the roofs and out to sea, and the second went screaming after it. Some people retreated indoors then. Sophie and Michael joined the rush of braver people down the sloping lanes to the dockside. There everyone seemed to think the best view was to be had along the curve of the harbour wall. Sophie hobbled to get out along it too, but there was no need to go beyond the shelter of the harbour master's hut. Two clouds were hanging in the air some way out to sea, on the other side of the harbour wall, the only two clouds in the calm blue sky. It was quite easy to see them. It was equally easy to see the dark patch of storm raging on the sea between the clouds, flinging up great white-topped waves. There was an unfortunate ship caught in that storm. Its masts were beating back and forth. They could see spouts of water hitting it on all sides. The crew were desperately trying to take in the sails, but one at least had torn to flying grey rags. "'Can't they have a care for that ship?' someone said indignantly. Then the wind and the waves from the storm hit the harbour wall. White water lashed over, and the brave persons out on the wall came crowding hurriedly back to the quayside, where the moored ships were heaving and grinding at their moorings. Among all this was a great deal of screaming in high singing voices. Sophie put her face out into the wind beyond the hut, where the screaming came from, and discovered that the raging magic had disturbed more than the sea and the wretched ship. A number of wet, slithery-looking ladies with flying green-brown hair were dragging themselves up onto the harbour wall, screaming and holding long, wet arms out to more screaming ladies, tossing in the waves. Every one of them had a fishtail instead of legs. Conf Found it, said Sophie. The mermaids from the curse. That meant only two more impossible things to come true now. She looked up at the two clouds. 
Hal was kneeling on the left hand one much larger and nearer than she would have expected. He was still dressed in black. Typically enough, he was staring over his shoulder at the frantic mermaids. He was not looking at them as if he remembered they were part of the curse at all. Keep your mind on the witch, the horse beside Sophie yelled. The witch sprang into being, standing on the right-hand cloud, in a whirl of flame-coloured robe and streaming red hair, with her arms raised to invoke further magic. As Hal turned and looked at her, her arms came down. Hal's cloud erupted into a fountain of rose-coloured flame. Heat from it swept across the harbour and the stones of the wall steamed. It's all right, gasped the horse. Hal was on the tossing, nearly sinking ship below. He was a tiny black figure now, leaning against the bucking mainmast. He let the witch know she had missed by waving at her cheekily. The witch saw him the instant he waved. Cloud, witch, and all at once became a savagely swooping red bird diving at the ship. The ship vanished. The mermaid sang a doleful scream. There was nothing but sulkily tossing water where the ship had been. But the diving bird was going too fast to stop. It plunged into the sea with a huge splash. Everyone on the quayside cheered. I knew that wasn't a real ship, really, someone behind Sophie said. Yes, it must have been an illusion, the horse said wisely. It was too small. As proof that the ship had been much nearer than it looked, the waves from the splash reached the harbour wall before Michael had stopped speaking. A twenty-foot green hill of water rode smoothly sideways across it, sweeping the screaming mermaids into the harbour, rolling every moored ship violently sideways and thudding in swirls round the harbour master's hut. An arm came out of the side of the horse and hauled Sophie back toward the quay. Sophie gasped and stumbled in knee-high grey water. The dogman bounded beside them, soaked to the ears. They had just reached the quay and the boats in the harbour had all just rolled upright when a second mountain of water rolled over the harbour wall. Out of its smooth side burst a monster. It was a long, black-clawed thing, half cat, half sea lion, and it came racing down the wall toward the quay. Another burst out of the wave as it smashed onto the harbour, long and low too, but scalier, and came racing after the first monster. Everyone realised that the fight was not over yet and splashed backward hurriedly against the sheds and houses on the quayside. Sophie fell over a rope and then a doorstep. The arm came out of the horse and dragged her upright as the two monsters streaked past in a scatter of salt water. Another wave swirled over the harbour wall and two more monsters burst out of that. They were identical to the first two, except the scaly one was closer to the cat-like one, and the next rolling wave brought two more closer together yet. "'What's going on?' Sophie squawked at this third pair racing past, shaking the stones of the jetty as they ran. Illusions, Michael's voice said out of the horse. Some of them, they're both trying to fool one another into chasing the wrong one. Which is who? said Sophie. No idea, said the horse. Some of the onlookers found the monsters too terrifying. Many went home. Others jumped down into the rolling ships to fend them off from the quay. Sophie and Michael joined the hard core of watchers who set off through the streets of Port Haven after the monsters. First they followed a river of seawater, then huge wet paw prints, and finally white gouges and scratches where the claws of the creatures had dug into the stones of the street. These led everyone out at the back of the town to the marshes, where Sophie and Michael had chased the shooting star. By this time, all six creatures were bounding black dots, vanishing into the flat distance. The crowd spread out into a ragged line on the bank, staring, hoping for more, and afraid of what they might see. After a while, no one could see anything but empty marsh. Nothing happened. Quite a few people were turning away to leave, when, of course, everyone else shouted, Look! A ball of pale fire rolled lazily up in the distance. It must have been enormous. The bang that went with it only reached the watchers when the fireball had become a spreading tower of smoke. The line of people all winced at the blunt thunder of it. They watched the smoke spread 
until it became part of the mist on the marshes. They went on watching after that, but there was simply peace and silence. The wind rattled the marsh weeds and birds began to dare to cry again. I reckon they must have done for one another, people said. The crowd gradually split into separate figures, hurrying away to jobs they had left half done. Sophie and Michael waited until the very last, when it was clear that it was indeed all over. Then they turned slowly back into Port Haven. Neither of them felt like speaking. Only the dog man seemed happy. He sauntered beside them so friskily that Sophie was sure he thought Hal was done for. He was so pleased with life that when they turned into the street where Hal's house was and there happened to be a stray cat crossing the road, the dog man uttered a joyful bark and galloped after it. He chased it with a dash and a skitter straight to the castle doorstep where it turned and glared. Get off! it mewed. This is all I needed. The dog backed away, looking ashamed. Michael clattered up to the door. How? he shouted. The cat shrank to kitten size and looked very sorry for itself. And you both look ridiculous, it said. Open the door. I'm exhausted. Sophie opened the door and the cat crawled inside. The cat crawled to the hearth where Calcifer was down to the merest blue flicker and, with an effort, got its front paws up onto the chair seat. There it grew, rather slowly, into howl, bent double. Did you kill the witch? Michael asked eagerly, taking off his cloak and becoming himself too. No, said Howl. He turned round and flopped into the chair, where he lay looking very tired indeed. All that on top of a cold, he croaked. Sophie, for pity's sake, take off that horrible red beard and find the bottle of brandy in the closet, unless you've drunk it or turned it into turpentine, of course. Sophie took off her cloak and found the brandy in a glass. Hal drank one glass off as if it were water. Then he poured out a second glass, and instead of drinking it, he dripped it carefully on Calcifer. Calcifer flared and sizzled and seemed to revive a little. Howell poured a third glass and lay back sipping it. Don't stand staring at me, he said. I don't know who won. The witch is mighty hard to come at. She relies mostly on her fire demon and stays behind out of trouble. But I think we gave her something to think about, eh, Calcifer? It's old. Calcifer said in a weak fizzle from under his logs. I'm stronger, but it knows things I never thought of. She's had it a hundred years, and it's half killed me. He fizzled a bit, then climbed further out of his logs to grumble. You might have warned me. I did, you old fraud, Hal said wearily. You know everything I know. Howl lay sipping brandy while Michael found bread and sausage for them to eat. Food revived them all, except perhaps the dog man, who seemed subdued now Howl was back after all. Calcifer began to burn up and look his usual blue self. This won't do, Howl said. He hauled himself to his feet. Look sharp, Michael. The witch knows we're in Port Haven. We're not only going to have to move the castle and the Kingsbury entrance now, I shall have to transfer Calcifer to the house that goes with that hat shop. Move me! Calcifer crackled. He was azure with apprehension. That's right, said Hal. You have a choice between market chipping or the witch. Don't go and be difficult. Curses! wailed Calcifer and dived to the bottom of the grate. Chapter 17, in which the moving castle moves house. Hal set to work as hard as if he had just had a week's rest. If Sophie had not seen him fight a gruelling magic battle an hour ago, she would never have believed it. He and Michael dashed about, calling measurements to one another, 
and chalking strange signs in the places where they had earlier put up metal brackets. They seemed to have to chalk every corner, including the backyard. Sophie's cubbyhole under the stairs and the odd-shaped place in the bathroom ceiling gave them quite a bit of trouble. Sophie and the dogman were pushed this way and that, and then pushed aside completely so that Michael could crawl about chalking a five-pointed star inside a circle on the floor. Michael had done this, and was brushing dust and chalk off his knees, when Howell came racing in with patches of whitewash all over his black clothes. Sophie and the dogman were pushed aside again, so that Howell could crawl about writing signs in and around both star and circle. Sophie and the dogman went to sit on the stairs. The dogman was shivering. This did not seem to be magic he liked. Howell and Michael raced out to the yard. Howell raced back. Sophie, he shouted. Quickly, what are we going to sell in that shop? Flowers, Sophie said, thinking of Mrs. Fairfax again. Perfect, said Howell, and hurried over to the door with a pot of paint and a small brush. He dipped the brush in the pot and carefully painted the blue blob yellow. He dipped again. This time the brush came out purple. He painted the green blob with it. At the third dip the paint was orange, and the orange went over the red blob. Howell did not touch the black blob. He turned away, and the end of his sleeve went into the paint pot along with the brush. Botheration, said Howell, dragging it out. The trailing tip of the sleeve was all colours of the rainbow. Howell shook it, and it was black again. Which suit is that really? Sophie asked. I've forgotten. Don't interrupt. The difficult part is just coming up, Howell said, rushing the paint pot back to the bench. He picked up a small jar of powder. Michael, where's the silver shovel? Michael raced in from the yard with a big gleaming spade. The handle was wood, but the blade did seem to be solid silver. All set out there, he said. Hal rested the shovel on his knee in order to chalk a sign on both handle and blade. He sprinkled red powder from the jar on it. He put a pinch of the same grains carefully in each point of the star and tipped all the rest into the middle. Stand clear, Michael, he said. Everyone stay clear. Are you ready, Calcifer? Calcifer emerged from between his logs in a long thread of blue flame. As ready as I shall ever be, he said. You know this could kill me, don't you? Look on the bright side, said Hal. It could be me it kills. Hold on tight. One, two, three. He dug the shovel into the grate very steadily and slowly, keeping it straight and level with the bars. For a second... He juggled it gently to get it under Calcifer. Then, even more steadily and gently, he raised it. Michael was quite obviously holding his breath. Done it, said Howell. Logs toppled sideways. They did not seem to be burning. Howell stood up and turned round, carrying Calcifer on the shovel. The room filled with smoke. The dogman whined and shivered. Howell coughed. He had a little trouble holding the shovel steady. Sophie's eyes were watering, and it was hard to see clearly, but as far as she could tell, Calcifer, just as he had said to her, did not have feet or legs either. He was a long, pointed blue face rooted in a faintly glowing black lump. The black lump had a dent in the front of it, which suggested at first sight that Calcifer was kneeling on tiny folded legs, but Sophie saw that was not so when the lump rocked slightly, showing it was rounded underneath. Calcifer obviously felt terribly unsafe. His orange eyes were round with fear, and he kept shooting feeble little arm-shaped flames out on either side in a useless attempt to take hold of the sides of the shovel. "'Won't be long!' Howell choked, trying to be soothing, but he had to shut his mouth hard and stand for a moment, trying not to cough. The shovel wobbled, and Calcifer looked terrified. Howell recovered. He took a long, careful step into the chalked circle, and then another into the centre of the five-pointed star. There, 
holding the shovel out level, he turned slowly round one complete turn, and Culsifer turned with him, sky blue and staring with panic. It felt as if the whole room turned with them. The dog man crouched close to Sophie. Michael staggered. Sophie felt as if their piece of the world had come loose and was swinging and jigging round in a circle sickeningly. She did not blame Calcifer for looking so frightened. Everything was still swinging and swaying as Hal took the same long, careful steps out of the star and out of the circle. He knelt down by the hearth and with enormous care slid Calcifer back into the grate again and packed the logs back round him. Calcifer flopped green flames uppermost. Howell leaned on the shovel and coughed. The room rocked and settled. For a few instants, while the smoke still hung everywhere, Sophie saw to her amazement the well-known outlines of the parlour in the house where she had been born. She knew it, even though its floor was bare boards and there were no pictures on the walls. The castle room seemed to wriggle itself into place inside the parlour, pushing it out here, pulling it in there, bringing the ceiling down to match its own beamed ceiling, until the two melted together and became the castle room again. Except perhaps it was now a bit higher and squarer than it had been. Have you done it, Culsifer? coughed Howell. I think so, Culsifer said, rising up the chimney. He looked none the worse for his ride on the shovel. You'd better check me, though. Howell helped himself up on the shovel and opened the door with the yellow blob downward. Outside was the street in Market Chipping that Sophie had known all her life. People she knew were walking past in the evening, taking a stroll before supper, the way a lot of people did in summer. Howell nodded at Calcifer, shut the door, turned the knob orange down, and opened it again. A wide, weedy drive wound away from the door now, among clumps of trees most picturesquely lit sideways by the low sun. In the distance stood a grand stone gateway with statues on it. "'Where is this?' said Hal. "'An empty mansion at the end of the valley,' Carcifer said rather defensively. "'It's the nice house you told me to find. It's quite fine.' "'I'm sure it is,' Hal said. "'I simply hope the real owners won't object.' He shut the door and turned the knob round to purple down. "'Now for the moving castle.' he said, as he opened it again. It was nearly dusk out there. A warm wind full of different scents blew in. Sophie saw a bank of dark leaves drift by, loaded with big purple flowers among the leaves. It spun slowly away, and its place was taken by a stand of dim white lilies and a glimpse of sunset on water beyond. The smell was so heavenly, that Sophie was halfway across the room before she was aware. No, your long nose stays out of there until tomorrow, Hal said, and he shut the door with a snap. That part's right on the edge of the waist. Well done, Calcifer, perfect. A nice house and lots of flowers as ordered. He flung the shovel down and went to bed, and he must have been tired. There were no groans, no shouts, and almost no coughing. Sophie and Michael were tired, too. Michael flopped into the chair and sat stroking the dogman, staring. Sophie perched on the stool, feeling strange. They had moved. It felt the same but different, quite confusingly. And why was the moving castle now on the edge of the waste? Was it the curse pulling Hal toward the witch? Or had Hal slithered out so hard that he had come out right behind himself and turned out what most people would call honest. Sophie looked at Michael to see what he thought. Michael was asleep, and so was the dog man. Sophie looked at Calcifer instead. 
sleepily flickering among rosy logs with his orange eyes almost shut. She thought of Calcifer pulsing almost white with white eyes, and then of Calcifer staring anxiously as he wobbled on the shovel. He reminded her of something. The whole shape of him did. Calcifer, she said. Were you ever a falling star? Calcifer opened one orange eye at her. Of course, he said. I can talk about that if you know. The contract allows me to. And how caught you? said Sophie. Five years ago, said Calcifer. Out on Port Haven marshes, just after he set up as Jenkin the Sorcerer. He chased me in seven league boots. I was terrified of him. I was terrified anyway, because when you fall, you know you're going to die. I'd have done anything rather than die. When Howl offered to keep me alive the way humans stay alive, I suggested a contract on the spot. Neither of us knew what we were getting into. I was grateful, and Howl only offered because he was sorry for me. Just like Michael, said Sophie. What's that? Michael said, waking up. Sophie, I wish we weren't right on the edge of the waste. I didn't know we would be. I don't feel safe. Nobody's safe in a wizard's house, Calcifer said, feelingly. Next morning, the door was set to Black Blob down, and to Sophie's great annoyance, it would not open at any setting. She wanted to see those flowers, witch or no witch. So she took out her impatience by fetching a bucket of water and scrubbing the chalk signs off the floor. Hal came in while she was doing it. Work, 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 he said, stepping over Sophie as she scrubbed. He looked a little strange. His suit was still dense black, but he had turned his hair fair again. It looked white against the black. Sophie glanced at him and thought of the curse. Hal may have been thinking of it too. He picked the skull out of the sink and held it in one hand mournfully. Alas, poor Yorick, he said. She heard mermaids, so it follows there is something rotten in the state of Denmark. I've caught an everlasting cold, but luckily I am terribly dishonest. I cling to that. He coughed pathetically, but his cold was getting better, and it did not sound very convincing. Sophie exchanged looks with the dogman, who was sitting watching her, looking as doleful as Howl. You should go back to Letty, she murmured. What's the matter? she said to Howl. Miss Angorian not going well? Dreadfully, said Howl. Lily Angorian has a heart like a boiled stone. He put the skull back in the sink and shouted for Michael. Food! Work! he yelled. After breakfast, they took everything out of the broom cupboard. Then Michael and Hal knocked a hole in the side wall of it. Dust flew out of the cupboard door and strange thumpings occurred. At last they both shouted for Sophie. Sophie came, meaningly carrying a broom, and there was an archway where the wall had been, leading to the steps that had always connected the shop and the house. Howl beckoned her to come and look at the shop. It was empty and echoing. Its floor was now tiled in black and white squares like Mrs. Pentstemon's hall, and the shelves, which had once held hats, had a vase of waxed silk roses and a small posy of velvet cowslips on them. Sophie realised she was expected to admire it, so she managed not to say anything. I found the flowers in the workshed out at the back, said Howl. Come and look at the outside. He opened the door into the street, and the same shop bell tinkled that Sophie had heard all her life. Sophie hobbled out into the empty early morning street. The shop front had been newly painted green and yellow. Curly letters over the window said, H. Jenkins, Fresh Flowers Daily. Changed your mind about common names, haven't you? said Sophie. 
For reasons of disguise only, said Howell. I prefer Pendragon. And where do the fresh flowers come from? Sophie asked. You can't say that and then sell wax roses off hats. Wait and see, said Howell, leading the way back into the shop. They went through and out into the yard Sophie had known all her life. It was only half the size now, because Howell's yard from the moving castle took up one side of it. Sophie looked up beyond the brick walls of Howell's yard to her own old house. It looked rather odd, because of the new window in it that belonged to Howell's bedroom, and it made Sophie feel odder still when she realized that Howell's window did not look out onto the things she saw now. She could see the window of her own old bedroom up above the shop. That made her feel odd, too, because there did not seem to be any way to get up into it now. As Sophie hobbled after Howell indoors again and up the stairs to the broom cupboard, she realized she was being very gruff. Seeing her own old home this way was giving her fearsome mixed feelings. I think it's all very nice, she said. Really? Hal said coldly. His feelings were hurt. He did so like to be appreciated, Sophie thought, sighing, as Hal went to the castle door and turned the knob to purple down. On the other hand, she didn't think she ever praised Hal any more than Calcifer, and she wondered why she should start now. The door opened. Big bushes loaded with flowers drifted gently past and stopped, so that Sophie could climb down among them. Between the bushes, lanes of long, bright green grass led in all directions. Howell and Sophie walked down the nearest, and the castle followed them, brushing petals off as it went. The castle, tall and black and misshapen though it was, blowing its peculiar little wisps of smoke from one turret or another, did not look out of place here. Magic had been at work here. Sophie knew it had and the castle fitted somehow. The air was hot and steamy, and filled with the scent of flowers, thousands of them. Sophie nearly said the smell reminded her of the bathroom after Howler had been in it, but she bit it back. The place was truly marvellous. Between the bushes and their loads of purple, red and white flowers, the wet grass was full of smaller flowers, pink ones with only three petals, giant pansies, wild flocks, Lupins of all colours, orange lilies, tall white lilies, irises, and myriad others. There were creepers growing flowers big enough for hats, cornflowers, poppies, and plants with strange shapes and stranger colours of leaves. Though it was not much like Sophie's dream of a garden like Mrs. Fairfax's, she forgot her gruffness and became delighted. You see, said Howell, he swung out an arm, and his black sleeve disturbed several hundred blue butterflies feasting on a bush of yellow roses. We can cut flowers by the armload every morning and sell them in market chipping with the dew still on them. At the end of that green lane, the grass became squashy. Vast orchids sprouted under the bushes. Howell and Sophie came suddenly to a steaming pool crowded with water lilies. The castle veered off sideways round the pool and drifted down another avenue lined with different flowers. If you come out here alone, bring your stick to test the ground with, Hal said. It's full of springs and bogs, and don't go any further that way. He pointed southeast, where the sun was a fierce white disk in the misty air. That's the waste over there, very hot and barren, and full of witch. Who made these flowers right on the edge of the waste? Sophie said. Wizard Solomon started it a year ago, Hal said, turning toward the castle. I think his notion was to make the waste flower and abolish the witch that way. He brought hot springs to the surface and got it growing. He was doing very nicely until the witch caught him. Mrs. Pentstemon said some other name, Sophie said. He came from the same place as you, didn't he? More or less, said Howell. I never met him, though. I came and had another go at the place a few months later. It seemed a good idea. That's how I came to meet the witch. She objected to it. Why? said Sophie. The castle was waiting for them. 
She likes to think of herself as a flower, Hal said, opening the door. A solitary orchid blooming in the waste. Pathetic, really. Sophie took another look at the crowded flowers as she followed Howl inside. There were roses, thousands of them. Won't the witch know you're here? I tried to do the thing she'd least expect, Howl said. And are you trying to find Prince Justin? Sophie asked. But Howl slithered out of answering by racing through the broom cupboard shouting for Michael. Chapter 18 In which the Scarecrow and Miss Angorian reappear They opened the flower shop the next day. As Howell had pointed out, it could not have been simpler. Every early morning all they had to do was to open the door with the knob purple down and go out into the swimming green haze to gather flowers. It soon became a routine. Sophie took her stick and her scissors and stumped about, chatting to her stick, using it to test the squashy ground or hook down sprays of high-up choice roses. Michael took an invention of his own, which he was very proud of. It was a large tin tub with water in it, which floated in the air and followed Michael wherever he went among the bushes. The dogman went too. He had a wonderful time rushing about the wet green lanes, chasing butterflies, or trying to catch the tiny bright birds that fed on the flowers. While he dashed about, Sophie cut armloads of long irises or lilies or frondy orange flowers or branches of blue hibiscus, and Michael loaded the bath with orchids, roses, starry white flowers, shiny vermilion ones, or anything that caught his fancy. They all enjoyed this time. Then, before the heat in the bushes grew too intense, they took the day's flowers back to the shop and arranged them in a motley collection of jugs and buckets, which Howell had dug out of the yard. Two of the buckets were actually the seven-league boots. Nothing, Sophie thought as she arranged shocks of gladiolus in them, could show how completely Howell had lost interest in Letty. He did not care now if Sophie used them or not. Howell was nearly always missing while they gathered flowers, and the doorknob was always turned black down. He was usually back for a late breakfast, looking dreamy, still in his black clothes. He would never tell Sophie which suit the black one really was. I'm in mourning for Mrs. Pentstemon, was all he would say. And if Sophie or Michael asked why Hal was always away at that time, Hal would look injured and say, If you want to talk to a school teacher, you have to catch her before school starts. Then he would disappear into the bathroom for the next two hours. Meanwhile, Sophie and Michael put on their fine clothes and opened the shop. Howell insisted on the fine clothes. He said it would attract custom. Sophie insisted they all wore aprons, and after the first few days when the people of Market Chipping simply stared through the window and did not come into the shop, the shop became very popular. Word had gone round that Jenkins had flowers like no flowers ever seen before. People Sophie had known all her life came and bought flowers by the bundle. None of them recognised her, and that made her feel very odd. They all thought she was Howell's old mother. But Sophie had had enough of being Howell's old mother. I'm his aunt, she told Mrs. Cesari. She became known as Aunt Jenkins. By the time Howell arrived in the shop, in a black apron to match his suit, he usually found it quite busy. He made it busier still. This was when Sophie began to be sure that the black suit was really the charmed grey and scarlet one. Any lady Howell served was sure to go away with at least twice the number of flowers she asked for. Most of the time Howell charmed them into buying ten times as much. Before long, Sophie noticed ladies peering in and deciding not to come into the shop when they saw Howell there. She did not blame them. 
If you just want a rose for a buttonhole, you do not want to be forced to buy three dozen orchids. She didn't discourage Hal when Hal took to spending long hours in the workshed across the yard. I'm setting up defences against the witch before you ask, he said. By the time I've finished, there will be no way she can get into any part of this place. There was sometimes a problem with leftover flowers. Sophie could not bear to see them wilting overnight. She found she could keep them fairly fresh if she talked to them. After that, she talked to flowers a lot. She got Michael to make her a plant nutrition spell, and she experimented in buckets in the sink and in tubs in the alcove where she used to trim hats. She found she could keep some plants fresh for days, so of course she experimented some more. She got the soot out of the yard and planted things in it, muttering busily. She grew a navy blue rose like that, which pleased her greatly. Its buds were coal black and its flowers opened bluer and bluer until they became almost the same blue as calcifer. Sophie was so delighted with it that she took roots from all the bags hanging on the beams and experimented with those. She told herself she'd never been happier in her life. This was not true. Something was wrong, and Sophie could not understand what. Sometimes she thought it was the way no one in market chipping recognized her. She did not dare go and see Martha, for fear Martha would not know her either. She did not dare tip the flowers out of the seven-league boots and go and see Letty for the same reason. She just could not bear either of her sisters to see her as an old woman. Micah went off with bunches of spare flowers to see Martha all the time. Sometimes Sophie thought that was what was the matter with her. Micah was so cheerful, and she was left on her own in the shop more and more often. But that did not seem to be quite it. Sophie enjoyed selling flowers on her own. Sometimes the trouble seemed to be Calcifer. Calcifer was bored. He had nothing to do except to keep the castle gently drifting along the lanes of grass and round the various pools and lake, and to make sure that they arrived in a new spot with new flowers every morning. His blue face was always leaning eagerly out of the grate when Sophie and Michael came in with their flowers. "'I want to see what it's like out there,' he said. Sophie brought him tasty-smelling leaves to burn, which made the castle room smell as strongly as the bathroom. But Calcifer said what he really wanted was company. They went into the shop all day and left him alone. So Sophie made Michael serve in the shop for at least an hour every morning while she went and talked to Calcifer. She invented guessing games to keep Calcifer occupied when she was busy. But Calcifer was still discontented. "'When are you going to break my contract with Howl?' he asked more and more often. And Sophie put Calcifer off. "'I'm working on it,' she said. "'It won't be long now.' This was not quite true. Sophie had stopped thinking of it unless she had to. When she put together what Mrs. Pentstemon had said with all the things Howl and Calcifer had said, she found she had some strong and rather terrible ideas about that contract. She was sure that breaking it would be the end of both Howl and Calcifer. Howl might deserve it, but Calcifer did not. And since Howl seemed to be working quite hard in order to slither out of the rest of the witch's curse, Sophie wanted to do nothing unless she could help. Sometimes Sophie thought it was simply that the dog man was getting her down. He was such a doleful creature. The only time he seemed to enjoy himself was when he chased down the green lanes between the bushes every morning. For the rest of the day, he trudged gloomily about after Sophie, sighing deeply. As Sophie could do nothing about him either, she was rather glad when the weather grew hotter and hotter toward midsummer day and the dogman took to lying in patches of shade out in the yard, panting. Meanwhile, the roots Sophie had planted had become quite interesting. 
The onion had become a small palm tree and was sprouting little onion-scented nuts. Another root grew into a sort of pink sunflower. Only one was slow to grow. When at last it put out two round green leaves, Sophie could hardly wait to see what it would grow into. The next day it looked as if it might be an orchid. It had pointed leaves spotted with mauve and a long stalk growing out of the middle with a large bud on it. The day after that, Sophie left the fresh flowers in the tin bath and hurried eagerly to the alcove to see how it was getting on. The bud had opened into a pink flower like an orchid that had been through a mangle. It was flat and joined to the stalk just below a round tip. There were four petals sprouting from a plump pink middle, two pointing downward, and two more halfway up that stuck out sideways. While Sophie stared at it, a strong scent of spring flowers warned her that Howl had come in and was standing behind her. "'What is that thing?' he said. "'If you were expecting an ultraviolet violet or an infrared geranium, you got it wrong, Mrs. Mad Scientist. "'It looks to me like a squashed baby flower,' Michael said, coming to look. "'It did, too.' Howl shot Michael an alarmed look and picked up the flower in its pot. He slid it out of the pot into his hand, where he carefully separated the white thready roots and the soot and the remains of the manure spell until he uncovered the brown forked root Sophie had grown it from. I might have guessed, he said. It's mandrake root. Sophie strikes again. You do have a touch, don't you, Sophie? He put the plant carefully back, passed it to Sophie, and went away, looking rather pale. So that was almost all the curse come true, Sophie thought, as she went to arrange the fresh flowers in the shop window. The mandrake root had had a baby. That only left one more thing. The wind to advance an honest mind. If that meant Howell's mind had to be honest, Sophie thought, there was a chance that the curse might never come true. She told herself it served Howell right anyway, for going courting Miss Angorian every morning in a charmed suit, but she still felt alarmed and guilty. She arranged a sheaf of white lilies in a seven-league boot. She crawled into the window to get them just so and she heard a regular clump-clump-clump from outside in the street. It was not the sound of a horse. It was the sound of a stick hitting the stones. Sophie's heart was behaving oddly, even before she dared look out of the window. There, sure enough, came the scarecrow, hopping slowly and purposefully down the centre of the street. The rags trailing from its outstretched arms were fewer and greyer, and the turnip of its face was withered into a look of determination, as if it had hopped ever since Howl hurled it away, until at last it had hopped its way back. Sophie was not the only one to be scared. The few people about that early were running away from the scarecrow as hard as they could run, but the scarecrow took no notice and hopped on. Sophie hid her face from it. We're not here, she told it in a fierce whisper. You don't know we're here. You can't find us. Hop away, fast. The clump clump of the hopping stick slowed as the scarecrow neared the shop. Sophie wanted to scream for howl, but all she seemed to be able to do was to go on repeating, We're not here. Go away. Quickly! And the hop hopping speeded up, just as she told it to, and the scarecrow hopped its way past the shop and on through market chipping. Sophie thought she was going to come over queer, but she seemed just to have been holding her breath. She took a deep breath and felt shaky with relief. If the scarecrow came back, she could send it away again. Howl had gone out when Sophie went into the castle room. He seemed awfully upset, Michael said. Sophie looked at the door. The knob was black down. 
not that upset, she thought. Michael went out too, to Cesare's that morning, and Sophie was alone in the shop. It was very hot. The flowers wilted in spite of the spells, and very few people seemed to want to buy any. What with this and the mandrake root and the scarecrow, all Sophie's feelings seemed to come to a head. She was downright miserable. It may be the curse hovering to catch up with Hal, she sighed to the flowers. But I think it's being the eldest, really. Look at me. I set out to seek my fortune, and I end up exactly where I started, and old as the hills still. Here the dogman put his glossy red snout round the door to the yard and whined. Sophie sighed. Never an hour passed without the creature checking up on her. Yes, I'm still here, she said. Where did you expect me to be? The dog came inside the shop. He sat up and stretched his paws out stiffly in front of him. Sophie realised he was trying to turn into a man. Poor creature. She tried to be nice to him because he was, after all, worse off than she was. Try harder, she said. Put your back into it. You can be a man if you want. The dog stretched and straightened his back and strained and strained. And just as Sophie was sure he was going to have to give up or topple over backward, he managed to rise to his hind legs and heave himself up into a distraught, ginger-haired man. I envy Howl, he panted. Does that so easily? I was dog in the hedge. You helped. Told Letty. I knew you. I'd keep watch. I was here before and... He began to double up again into a dog and howled with annoyance. With which in sharp, he wailed and fell forward onto his hands, growing a great deal of grey and white hair as he did so. Sophie stared at the large, shaggy dog that now stood there. You were with the witch, she said. She remembered now, the anxious, ginger-haired man who had stared at her in horror. Then you know who I am, and you know I'm under a spell. Does Letty know, too? The huge, shaggy head nodded. And she called you Gaston, Sophie remembered. Oh, my friend, she has made it hard for you. Fancy having all that hair in this weather. You'd better go somewhere cool. The dog nodded again and shambled miserably into the yard. But why did Letty send you? Sophie wondered. She felt thoroughly put out and disturbed by this discovery. She went up the stairs and through the broom cupboard to talk to Calcifer. Calcifer was not much help. It doesn't make any difference how many people know you're under a spell, he said. It hasn't helped the dog much, has it? No, but... Sophie began. But just then the castle door clicked and opened. Sophie and Calcifer looked. They saw the doorknob was still set to black down and they expected Hal to come through it. It was hard to say which of them was more astonished when the person who slid through cautiously round the door turned out to be Miss Angorian. Miss Angorian was equally astonished. Oh, I beg your pardon, she said. I thought Mr. Jenkins might be here. He's out, Sophie said stiffly, and she wondered where Hal had gone if not to see Miss Angorian. Miss Angorian let go of the door, which she had been clutching in her surprise. She left it swinging open on nothing and came pleadingly towards Sophie. Sophie found she had got up herself and come across the room. It seemed as if she was trying to block Miss Angorian off. Please, said Miss Angorian, don't tell Mr. Jenkins I was here. To tell you the truth, I only encouraged him in hope of getting news of my fiancé, Ben Sullivan, you know. I'm positive Ben disappeared to the same place Mr. Jenkins keeps disappearing to. Only Ben didn't come back. There's no Mr. Sullivan here, Sophie said, and she thought, That's Wizard Solomon's name. I don't believe a word of it. Oh, I know that, Miss Angorian said. But this feels like the right place. 
Do you mind if I just look round a little to give myself some idea of the sort of life Ben's leading now? She hooked her sheet of black hair behind one ear and tried to walk further into the room. Sophie stood in the way. This forced Miss Angorian to tiptoe pleadingly away sideways toward the workbench. How very quaint, she said, looking at the bottles and the jars. What a quaint little town, she said, looking out of the window. It's called Market Chipping, Sophie said, and she moved round and herded Miss Angorian backward toward the door. And what's up those stairs? Miss Angorian asked, pointing to the open door to the stairs. Howl's private room, Sophie said firmly, walking Miss Angorian away backward. And what's through that other open door? Miss Angorian asked. A flower shop, said Sophie. Nosy Parker, she thought. By this time Miss Angorian either had to back into the chair or out through the door again. She stared at Calcifer in a vague, frowning way, as if she was not sure what she was seeing, and Calcifer simply stared back without saying a word. This made Sophie feel better about being so very unfriendly. Only people who understood Calcifer were really welcome in Hull's house. But now Miss Angorian made a dive round the chair and noticed Hull's guitar leaning in its corner. She snatched it up with a gasp, and turned round, holding it to her chest possessively. "'Where did you get this?' she demanded in a low, emotional voice. "'Ben had a guitar like this. It could be Ben's.' "'I heard Hal bought it last winter,' Sophie said, and she walked forward again, trying to scoop Miss Angorian out of her corner and through the door. "'Something's happened to Ben,' Miss Angorian said throbbingly. He would never have parted from his guitar. Where is he? I know he can't be dead. I'd know in my heart if he were. Sophie wondered whether to tell Miss Angorian that the witch had caught Wizard Suleiman. She looked across to see where the human skull was. She had half a mind to wave it in Miss Angorian's face and say it was Wizard Suleiman's. But the skull was in the sink, hidden behind a bucket of spare ferns and lilies and she knew that if she went over there, Miss Angorian would ooze out into the room again. Besides, it would be unkind. "'May I take this guitar?' Miss Angorian said huskily, clutching it to her, "'to remind me of Ben.' The throb in Miss Angorian's voice annoyed Sophie. "'No,' she said. "'There's no need to be so intense about it. "'You've no proof it was his.' She hobbled close to Miss Angorian and seized the guitar by its neck. Miss Angorian stared at her over it with wide, anguished eyes. Sophie dragged. Miss Angorian hung on. The guitar gave out horrible, out-of-tune jangles. Sophie jerked it out of Miss Angorian's arms. Don't be silly, she said. You've no right to walk into people's castles and take their guitars. I've told you, Mr. Sullivan's not here. Now go back to Wales. Go on and she used the guitar to push Miss Angorian backward through the open door. Miss Angorian backed into the nothingness until half of her vanished. "'You're hard,' she said reproachfully. "'Yes, I am,' said Sophie, and slammed the door on her. She turned the knob to orange down to prevent Miss Angorian coming back and dumped the guitar back in its corner with a firm twang. "'And don't you dare tell Howl she was here.' she said unreasonably to Calcifer. I bet she came to see Howl. The rest was just a pack of lies. Wizard Suleiman was settled here years ago. He probably came to get away from her beastly, throbbing voice. Calcifer chuckled. I've never seen anyone got rid of so fast, he said. This made Sophie feel both unkind and guilty. After all, she herself had walked into the castle in much the same way, and she had been twice as nosy as Miss Angorian. Gah, she said. She stumped into the bathroom and stared at her withered old face in the mirrors. She picked up one of the packets labelled skin and then tossed it down again. Even young and fresh, 
She did not think her face compared particularly well with Miss Angorian's. Gah, she said. Doh. She hobbled rapidly back and seized ferns and lilies from the sink. She hobbled them, dripping, to the shop, where she rammed them into a bucket of nutrition spell. Be daffodils, she told them in a mad, angry, croaking voice. Be daffodils in June, you beastly things. The dog man put his shaggy face round the yard door. When he saw the mood Sophie was in, he backed out again hurriedly. When Michael came merrily in with a large pie a minute later, Sophie gave him such a glare that Michael instantly remembered a spell Howell had asked him to make up and fled away through the broom cupboard. Gah! Sophie snarled after him. She bent over her bucket again. Be daffodils! Be daffodils! she croaked. It did not make her feel any better that she knew it was a silly way to behave. Chapter 19 In which Sophie expresses her feelings with weed killer. Howell opened the shop door toward the end of the afternoon and sauntered in, whistling. He seemed to have got over the mandrake route. It did not make Sophie feel any better to find he had not gone to Wales after all. She gave him her very fiercest glare. Merciful heavens, Hal said. I think that turned me to stone. What's the matter? Sophie only snarled. What suit are you wearing? Hal looked down at his black garments. Does it matter? Yes, growled Sophie. And don't give me that about being in mourning. Which one is it really? Hal shrugged and held up one trailing sleeve, as if he were not sure which it was. He stared at it, looking puzzled. The black colour of it ran downward from his shoulder into the pointed hanging tip. His shoulder and the top of his sleeve grew brown, then grey, while the pointed tip turned inkier and inkier, until Hal was wearing a black suit with one blue and silver sleeve, whose end seemed to have been dipped in tar. That one, he said, and let the black spread back up to his shoulder again. Sophie was somehow more annoyed than ever. She gave a wordless grump of rage. Sophie, Hal said in his most laughing, pleading way. The dog man pushed open the yard door and shambled in. He never would let Hal talk to Sophie for long. Hal stared at it. You've got an old English sheepdog now, he said, as if he was glad of the distraction. Two dogs are going to take a lot of feeding. There's only one dog, Sophie said crossly. He's under a spell. He is, said Hal and he set off toward the dog with a speed that showed he was quite glad to get away from Sophie. This, of course, was the last thing the dog man wanted. He backed away. Howell pounced and caught him by two handfuls of shaggy hair before he could reach the door. So he is, he said, and knelt down to look into what could be seen of the sheepdog's eyes. Sophie, he said, what do you mean by not telling me about this? This dog is a man, and he's in a terrible state. Hal whirled round on one knee, still holding the dog. Sophie looked into Hal's glass marble glare and realised that Hal was angry now, really angry. Good. Sophie felt like a fight. You could have noticed for yourself, she said, glaring back, daring Hal to do his worst with green slime. Anyway, the dog didn't want... Hal was too angry to listen. He jumped up and hauled the dog across the tiles. And so I would have done if I hadn't had things on my mind, he said. Come on, I want you in front of Calcifer. The dog braced all four shaggy feet. How lugged at it, braced and sliding. Michael, he yelled. There was a particular sound to that yell which brought Michael running. And did you know this dog was really a man? Howell asked as he and Michael dragged the reluctant mountain of dog up the stairs. He's not, is he? Michael asked, shocked and surprised. Then I let you off, and just blame Sophie, 
Hal said, hauling the dog through the broom cupboard. Anything like this is always Sophie. But you knew, didn't you, Calcifer? He said, as the two of them dragged the dog in front of the hearth. Calcifer retreated until he was bent backward against the chimney. You never asked, he said. Do I have to ask you? Hal said. All right, I should have noticed myself. But you disgust me, Calcifer. Compared with the way the witch treats her demon, you live a revoltingly easy life, and all I ask in return is that you tell me things I need to know. This is twice you've let me down. Now help me get this creature to its own shape this minute. Calcifer was an unusually sickly shade of blue. All right, he said sulkily. The dogman tried to get away, but Hal got his shoulder under its chest and shoved, so that it went up onto its hind legs willy-nilly. Then he and Michael held it there. What's the silly creature holding out for? Hal panted. This feels like one of the Witch of the Wastes again, doesn't it? Yes, there are several layers of it, said Calcifer. Let's get the dog part off anyway, said Hal. Calcifer surged to a deep, roaring blue. Sophie, watching prudently from the door of the broom cupboard, saw the shaggy dog shape fade away inside the man shape. It faded to dog again, then back to man, blurred, then hardened. Finally, Howl and Michael were each holding the arm of a ginger-haired man in a crumpled brown suit. Sophie was not surprised she had not recognized him. Apart from his anxious look, his face was almost totally lacking in personality. Now, who are you, my friend? Howl asked him. The man put his hands up and shakily felt his face. Uh, I'm not sure, Calcifer said. The most recent name he answered to was Percival. The man looked at Calcifer as if he wished Calcifer did not know this. Did I? he said. Then we'll call you Percival for now, Hal said. He turned the ex-dog round and sat him in the chair. Sit there and take it easy and tell us what you do remember. By the feel of you, the witch had you for some time. Yes, said Percival, rubbing his face again. She took my head off. I... I remember being on a shelf, looking at the rest of me. Michael was astonished. But you'd be dead, he protested. Not necessarily, said Hal. You haven't got to that sort of witchcraft yet, but I could take any piece of you I wanted and leave the rest of you alive, if I went about it the right way. He frowned at the ex-dog. But I'm not sure the witch put this one back together properly. Calcifer who was obviously trying to prove that he was working hard for Howell, said, This man is incomplete, and he has parts from some other man, too. Percival looked more distraught than ever. Don't alarm him, Calcifer, Howell said. He must feel bad enough anyway. Do you know why the witch took your head off, my friend? He asked Percival. No, said Percival. I don't remember anything. Sophie knew that could not be true. She snorted, rather. Michael was suddenly seized with the most exciting idea. He leaned over Percival and asked, Did you ever answer to the name of Justin or your Royal Highness? Sophie snorted again. She knew this was ridiculous even before Percival said, No, the witch called me Gaston, but that isn't my name. Don't crowd him, Michael, said Howl, and don't make Sophie snort again. The mood she's in, she'll bring down the castle next time. Though that seemed to mean Howl was no longer angry, Sophie found she was angrier than ever. She stumped off into the shop, where she banged about, shutting the shop and putting things away for the night. She went to look at her daffodils. Something had gone horribly wrong with them. They were wet brown things trailing out of a bucket full of the most poisonous-smelling liquid she'd ever come across. 
Oh, confound it all, Sophie yelled. What's all this now, said Howl, arriving in the shop. He bent over the bucket and sniffed. You seem to have some rather efficient weed killer here. How about trying it on those weeds on the drive of the mansion? I will, said Sophie. I feel like killing something. She slammed around until she had found a watering can and stumped through into the castle with the can and the bucket, where she hurled open the door orange down onto the mansion drive. Percival looked up anxiously. They had given him the guitar, rather as you gave a baby a rattle, and he was sitting making horrible twangings. You go with her, Percival, Howe said. The mood she's in, she'll be killing all the trees, too. So Percival laid down the guitar and took the bucket carefully out of Sophie's hand. Sophie stumped out into a golden summer evening at the end of the valley. Everyone had been too busy up to now to pay much attention to the mansion. It was much grander than Sophie had realised. It had a weedy terrace with statues along the edge and steps down to the drive. When Sophie looked back, on the pretext of telling Percival to hurry up, she saw the house was very big, with more statues along the roof and rows of windows. But it was derelict. Green mildew ran down the peeling wall from every window. Many of the windows were broken, and the shutters that should have folded against the wall beside them were grey and blistered and hanging sideways. Ha! Huh, said Sophie. I think the least Howl could do is make the place look a bit more lived in. But no, he's far too busy gadding off to Wales. Don't just stand there, Percival. Pour some of that stuff into the can and then come along behind me. Percival meekly did as she said. He was no fun at all to bully. Sophie suspected that was why Howl had sent him with her. She snorted and took her anger out on the weeds. Whatever the stuff was that had killed the daffodils, it was strong. The weeds in the drive died as soon as it touched them. So did the grass at the sides of the drive, until Sophie calmed down a little. The evening calmed her. The fresh air was blowing off the distant hills, and clumps of trees planted at the sides of the drive rustled majestically in it. Sophie weed-killed her way down a quarter of the drive. You remember a great deal more than you let on, she accused Percival, while he refilled her can. What did the witch really want with you? Why did she bring you into the shop with her that time? She wanted to find out about Howl, Percival said. Howl, said Sophie. But you didn't know him, did you? No. But I must have known something. It had to do with the curse she'd put on him, Percival explained, but I've no idea what it was. She took it, you see, after we came to the shop. I feel bad about that. I was trying to stop her knowing because a curse is an evil thing, and I did it by thinking about Letty. Letty was just in my head. I don't know how I knew her, because Letty said she'd never seen me when I went to Upper Folding. But I knew all about her, enough so that when the witch made me tell her about Letty, I said she kept a hat shop in Market Chipping. So the witch went there to teach us both a lesson. And you were there. She thought you were Letty. I was horrified because I didn't know Letty had a sister. Sophie picked up the can and weed killed generously, wishing the weeds were the witch. And she turned you into a dog straight after that? Just outside the town, said Percival. As soon as I'd let her know what she wanted, she opened the carriage door and said, Off you run, I'll call you when I need you. And I ran, because I could feel some sort of spell following me. It caught up just as I got to a farm, and the people there saw me change into a dog and thought I was a werewolf and tried to kill me. I had to bite one to get away, but I couldn't get rid of the stick, and it stuck in the hedge when I tried to get through. Sophie Weed killed her way down another curve of the drive as she listened. Then you went to Mrs. Fairfax's? Yes. I was looking for Letty. 
They were both very kind to me, Percival said, even though they'd never seen me before. And Wizard Howe kept visiting to court Letty. Letty didn't want him, and she asked me to bite him to get rid of him, until Howe suddenly began asking her about you, and... Sophie narrowly missed weed killing her shoes. Since the gravel was smoking where the stuff met it, this was probably just as well. What? He said, I know someone called Sophie who looks a little like you, and Letty said that's my sister without thinking, Percival said, and she got terribly worried then, particularly as Hal went on asking about her sister. Letty said she could have bitten her tongue off. The day you came there, she was being nice to Howell in order to find out how he knew you. Howell said you were an old woman, and Mrs. Fairfax said she'd seen you. Letty cried and cried. She said, something terrible has happened to Sophie, and the worst of it is she'll think she's safe from Howell. Sophie's too kind herself to see how heartless Howell is and she was so upset that I managed to turn into a man long enough to say I'd go and keep an eye on you. Sophie spread weed killer in a great smoking arc. Bother Letty. It's very kind of her, and I love her dearly for it. I've been quite as worried about her. But I do not need a watchdog. Yes, you do, said Percival, or you did. I arrived far too late. Sophie swung round, weed killer and all. Percival had to leap into the grass and run for his life behind the nearest tree. The grass died in a long brown swathe behind him as he ran. Curse everyone, Sophie cried out. I've done with a lot of you. She dumped the smoking watering can in the middle of the drive and marched off through the weeds toward the stone gateway. Too late, she muttered as she marched. What nonsense! Howl's not only heartless, he's impossible. Besides, she added, I am an old woman. But she could not deny that something had been wrong ever since the moving castle moved, or even before that, and it seemed to tie up with the way Sophie seemed so mysteriously unable to face either of her sisters. And all the things I told the king are true, she went on. She was going to march seven leagues on her own two feet and not come back. Show everyone. Who cared that poor Mrs. Pentstemon had relied on Sophie to stop Howell from going to the bad? Sophie was a failure anyway. It came of being the eldest. And Mrs. Pentstemon had thought Sophie was Howell's loving old mother anyway, hadn't she? Or had she? Uneasily. Sophie realised that a lady whose trained eye could detect a charm sewn into a suit could surely even more easily detect the stronger magic of the witch's spell. Oh, confound that grey and scarlet suit, Sophie said. I refuse to believe that I was the one that got caught with it. The trouble was the blue and silver suit seemed to have worked just the same. She stumped a few steps further. Anyway, she said with great relief, Howl doesn't like me. This reassuring thought would have been enough to keep Sophie walking all night, had not a sudden familiar uneasiness swept over her. Her ears had caught a distant tock, tock, tock. She looked sharply under the low sun, and there, on the road which wound away behind the stone gate, was a distant figure with outstretched arms hopping, hopping, Sophie picked up her skirts, whirled round, and sped back the way she had come. Dust and gravel flew up round her in clouds. Percival was standing forlornly in the drive beside the bucket and the watering can. Sophie seized him and dragged him behind the nearest trees. Is something wrong? he said. Quiet! It's that dratted scarecrow again! Sophie gasped. She shut her eyes. We're not here, she said. You can't find us. Go away! Go away, fast, fast, fast. But why, said Percival, shut up, not here, not here, not here, Sophie said desperately. She opened one eye. The scarecrow, almost between the gateposts, was standing still, swaying uncertainly. That's right, said Sophie. We're not here. Go away, fast. 
twice as fast, three times as fast, ten times as fast, go away. And the scarecrow hesitantly swayed round on its stick and began to hop back up the road. After the first few hops, it was going in giant leaps, faster and faster, just as Sophie had told it to. Sophie hardly breathed and did not let go of Percival's sleeve until the scarecrow was out of sight. "'What's wrong with it?' said Percival. "'Why didn't you want it?' Sophie shuddered. Since the scarecrow was out on the road, she did not dare leave now. She picked up the watering can and stumped back to the mansion. A fluttering caught her eye as she went. She looked up at the building. The flutter was from long white curtains blowing from an open French window beyond the statues of the terrace. The statues were now clean white stone, and she could see curtains at most of the windows and glass too. The shutters were now folded properly beside them, newly painted white. Not a green stain or a blister marked the new creamy plaster of the house front. The front door was a masterpiece of black paint and gold scroll work, centering on a gilded lion with a ring in its mouth for a door knocker. Ha! Huh, said Sophie. She resisted the temptation to go in through the open window and explore. That was what Howell wanted her to do. She marched straight to the front door, seized the golden doorknob, and threw the door open with a crash. Howell and Michael were at the bench, hastily dismantling a spell. Part of it must have been to change the mansion, but the rest, as Sophie well knew, had to be a listening-in spell of some kind. As Sophie stormed in, both their faces shot nervously round toward her. Calcifer instantly plunged down under his logs. "'Keep behind me, Michael,' said Howell. "'Eavesdropper!' Sophie shouted. "'Snooper!' "'What's wrong?' Hal said. "'Do you want the shutters black and gold, too?' "'You bare-faced!' Sophie stuttered. "'That wasn't the only thing you heard. You, "'You... how long have you known I was... "'I am... under a spell?' said Hal. "'Well, now...' "'I told him,' Michael said, looking nervously round Hal. "'My Letty... "'You!' Sophie shrieked. The other Letty let the cat out of the bag, too, Hal said quickly. You know she did. Our Mrs. Fairfax talked a great deal that day. There was a time when everyone seemed to be telling me. Even Calcifer did when I asked him. But do you honestly think I don't know my own business well enough not to spot a strong spell like that when I see it? I had several goes at taking it off you when you weren't looking. But nothing seems to work. I took you to Mrs. Pentstemon hoping she could do something, but she evidently couldn't. I came to the conclusion that you liked being in disguise. Disguise? Sophie yelled. Hal laughed at her. It must be, since you're doing it yourself, he said. What a strange family you are. Is your name really Letty, too? This was too much for Sophie. Percival edged nervously in just then, carrying the half-full bucket of weed killer. Sophie dropped her can, seized the bucket from him, and threw it at Howl. Howl ducked, Michael dodged the bucket. The weed killer went up in a sheet of sizzling green flame from floor to ceiling. The bucket clanged into the sink, where all the remaining flowers died instantly. Ow! said Calcifer from under his logs. That was strong! Howl carefully picked the skull out from under the smoking brown remains of the flowers and dried it on one of his sleeves. Of course it was strong, he said. Sophie never does things by halves. The skull, as Hal wiped it, became bright new white, and the sleeve he was using developed a faded blue and silver patch. Hal set the skull on the bench and looked at his sleeve ruefully. Sophie had half a mind to stump straight out of the castle again and away down the drive. But there was that scarecrow. She settled for stumping to the chair instead, where she sat and fell into a deep sulk. I'm not going to speak to any of them, she thought. Sophie, Hal said, I did my best. 
Haven't you noticed that your aches and pains have been better lately? Or do you enjoy having those, too? Sophie didn't answer. Hal gave her up and turned to Percival. I'm glad to see that you have some brain, after all, he said. You had me worried. I really don't remember very much, Percival said, but he stopped behaving like a half-wit. He picked the guitar up and tuned it. He had it sounding much nicer in seconds. My sorrow revealed, Hal said pathetically. I was born an unmusical Welshman. Did you tell Sophie all of it? Or do you really know what the witch was trying to find out? She wanted to know about Wales, said Percival. I thought that was it, Hal said soberly. Ah, well. He went away into the bathroom, where he was gone for the next two hours. During that time, Percival played a number of tunes on the guitar in a slow, thoughtful way, as if he was teaching himself how to, while Michael crawled about the floor with a smoking rag, trying to get rid of the weed killer. Sophie sat in the chair and said not a word. Calcifer kept bobbing up and peeping at her and going down again under his logs. Howell came out of the bathroom with his suit glossy black, his hair glossy white, in a cloud of steam smelling of gentians. I may be back quite late, he said to Michael. It's going to be midsummer day after midnight, and the witch may well try something. So keep all the defences up and remember all I told you, please. All right, Michael said, putting the steaming remains of the rag in the sink. Hal turned to Percival. I think I know what's happened to you, he said. It's going to be a fair job sorting you out, but I'll have a go tomorrow after I get back. Hal went to the door and stopped with his hand on the knob. Sophie? Are you still not talking to me? he asked miserably. Sophie knew Hal could sound unhappy in heaven if it suited him, and he had just used her to get information out of Percival. No, she snarled. Hal sighed and went out. Sophie looked up and saw that the knob was pointing black down. That does it, she thought. I don't care if it is Midsummer Day tomorrow. I'm leaving. Chapter 20 In which Sophie finds further difficulties in leaving the castle. Midsummer Day dawned. About the same moment that it did, Howl crashed in through the door with such a noise that Sophie shot up in her cubbyhole, convinced that the witch was hot on his heels. They think so much about me that they always play without me, Hal bellowed. Sophie realized that he was only trying to sing Calcifer's saucepan song and lay down again, whereupon Hal fell over the chair and caught his foot in the stool so that it shot across the room. After that, he tried to go upstairs through the broom cupboard and then the yard. This seemed to puzzle him a little, but finally he discovered the stairs, all except the bottom one, and fell up them on his face. The whole castle shook. What's the matter? Sophie asked, sticking her head through the banister. Rugby club reunion, Hal replied with thick dignity. Didn't know I used to fly up the wing for my university, did you, Mrs. Nose? If you were trying to fly, you must have forgotten how, Sophie said. I was born to strange sights, said Hal. Things invisible to see, and I was just on my way to bed when you interrupted me. I know where all past years are and who cleft the devil's foot. Go to bed, you fool, Calcifer said sleepily. You're drunk. Who? Me? said Hal. I assure you, my friends, I am consoled Stober. He got up and stalked upstairs, feeling for the wall as if he thought it might escape him unless he kept in touch with it. His bedroom door did escape him. What a lie that was, Hal remarked as he walked into the wall. 
My shining dishonesty will be the salvation of me. He walked into the wall several times more in several different places before he discovered his bedroom door and crushed his way through it. Sophie could hear him falling about, saying that his bed was dodging. He's quite impossible, Sophie said, and she decided to leave at once. Unfortunately, the noise Howell made woke Michael up and Percival, who was sleeping on the floor in Michael's room. Michael came downstairs, saying that they were so thoroughly awake that they might as well go out and gather the flowers for the midsummer garlands, while the day was still cool. Sophie was not sorry to go out into the place of flowers for one last time. There was a warm, milky haze out there, filled with scent and half-hidden colours. Sophie thumped along, testing the squashy ground with her stick, and listening to the whirrings and twitters of the thousands of birds, feeling truly regretful. She stroked a moist satin lily and fingered one of the ragged purple flowers with long powdery stamens. She looked back at the tall black castle breasting the mist behind them. She sighed. He made it much better, Percival remarked as he put an armful of hibiscus into Michael's floating bath. Who did? said Michael. How? said Percival. There were only bushes at first, and they were quite small and dry. You remember being here before? Michael asked excitedly. He had by no means given up his idea that Percival might be Prince Justin. I think I was here with the witch, Percival said doubtfully. They fetched two bath loads of flowers. Sophie noticed that when they came in the second time, Michael spun the knob over the door several times. That must have had something to do with keeping the witch out. Then, of course, there were the midsummer garlands to make. That took a long time. Sophie had meant to leave Michael and Percival to do that, but Michael was too busy asking Percival cunning questions, and Percival was very slow at the work. Sophie knew what made Michael excited. There was a sort of air about Percival, as if he expected something to happen soon. It made Sophie wonder just how much in the power of the witch he still was. She had to make most of the garlands. Any thoughts she might have had about staying and helping Howl against the witch vanished. Howl, who could have made all the garlands just by waving his hand, was now snoring so loudly she could hear him right through in the shop. They were so long making the garlands that it was time to open the shop before they had finished. Michael fetched them bread and honey, and they ate while they dealt with the tremendous first rush of customers. Although Midsummer Day, in the way of holidays, had turned out to be a grey and chilly day in market chipping, half the town came, dressed in fine holiday clothes, to buy flowers and garlands for the festival. There was the usual jostling crowd out in the street, so many people came into the shop that it was getting on for midday before Sophie finally stole away up the stairs and through the broom cupboard. They had taken so much money, Sophie thought, as she stole about packing up some food and her old clothes in a bundle, that Michael's hoard under the hearthstone would be ten times the size. Have you come to talk to me? asked Calcifer. In a moment, Sophie said crossing the room with her bundle behind her back. She did not want Calcifer raising an outcry about that contract. She stretched out her hand to unhook her stick from the chair, and somebody knocked at the door. Sophie stuck with her hand stretched out, looking inquiringly at Calcifer. "'It's the mansion door,' said Calcifer, "'flesh and blood and harmless.' The knocking came again. This always happens when I try to leave, Sophie thought. She turned the knob orange down and opened the door. There was a carriage in the drive beyond the statues, pulled by a goodish pair of horses. Sophie could see it round the edges of the very large footman who had been doing the knocking. Mrs. Sir Cheverell Smith to call upon the new occupants, said the footman. How very awkward, Sophie thought. 
It was the result of Howell's new paint and curtains. We're not at ho she began, but Mrs. Sir Cheverell Smith swept the footman aside and came in. Wait with the carriage, Theobald, she said to the footman as she sailed past Sophie, folding her parasol. It was Fanny. Fanny looking wonderfully prosperous in cream silk. She was wearing a cream silk hat trimmed with roses, which Sophie remembered only too well. She remembered what she had said to that hat as she trimmed it. You are going to have to marry money. And it was quite clear from the look of her that Fanny had. Oh, dear, said Fanny, looking round. There must be some mistake. This is the servants' quarters. Well, uh, we're not really quite moved in yet, madam, Sophie said and wondered how Fanny would feel if she knew that the old hat shop was only just beyond the broom cupboard. Fanny turned round and gasped at Sophie. Sophie! she exclaimed. Oh, good gracious, child, what's happened to you? You look about ninety. Have you been very ill? And to Sophie's surprise, Fanny threw aside her hat and her parasol and all of her grand manner and flung her arms around Sophie and wept. Oh, I didn't know what had happened to you, she sobbed. I went to Martha, and I sent to Letty, and neither of them knew. They changed places, silly girls, did you know? But nobody knew a thing about you. I've a reward out still, and here you are, working as a servant, when you could be living in luxury up the hill with me and Mr. Smith. Sophie found she was crying as well. She hurriedly dropped her bundle and led Fanny to the chair. She pulled the stool up and sat beside Fanny, holding her hand. By this time, they were both laughing as well as crying. They were most powerfully glad to see one another again. It's a long story, Sophie said, after Fanny had asked her six times what had happened to her. When I looked in the mirror and saw myself like this, it was such a shock that I sort of wandered away. Overwork, Fanny said wretchedly. How I've blamed myself. Not really, said Sophie, and you mustn't worry because Wizard Howl took me in. Wizard Howl, exclaimed Fanny. That wicked, wicked man. Has he done this to you? Where is he? Let me at him. She seized her parasol and became so very warlike that Sophie had to hold her down. Sophie didn't care to think how Hal might react if Fanny woke him by stabbing him with her parasol. No, no, she said. Hal has been very kind to me. And this was true, Sophie realized. Hal showed his kindness rather strangely, but considering all Sophie had done to annoy him, he had been very good to her indeed. But they say he eats women alive. Fanny said, still struggling to get up. Sophie held down her waving parasol. He doesn't really, she said. Do listen. He's not wicked at all. There was a bit of a fizz from the grate at this, where Carcifer was watching with some interest. He isn't, Sophie said, to Carcifer as much as to Fanny. In all the time I've been here, I've not seen him work a single evil spell. Which, again, was true, she knew. Then I have to believe you, Fanny said, relaxing, though I'm sure it must be your doing if he's reformed. You always did have a way with you, Sophie. You could stop Martha's tantrums when I couldn't do a thing with her. And I always said it was thanks to you that Letty only got her own way half of the time instead of all the time. But you should have told me where you were, love. Sophie knew she should have. She had taken Martha's view of Fanny whole and entire when she should have known Fanny better. She was ashamed. Fanny could not wait to tell Sophie about Mr. Sir Cheverell Smith. She launched into a long and excited account of how she had met Mr. Smith the very week Sophie had left and married him before the week was out. Sophie watched her as she talked. 
Being old gave her an entirely new view of Fanny. She was a lady who was still young and pretty, and she had found the hat shop as boring as Sophie did. But she had stuck with it and done her best, both with the shop and with the three girls, until Mr. Hatter died. Then she had suddenly been afraid she was just like Sophie, old with no reason and nothing to show for it. And then... With you not being there to pass it on to, there seemed no reason not to sell the shop, Fanny was saying. When there was a clatter of feet in the broom cupboard, Michael came through saying, We've shut the shop, and look who's here. He was holding Martha's hand. Martha was thinner and fairer, and almost looked like herself again. She let go of Michael and rushed at Sophie, shouting, Sophie! You should have told me, while she flung her arms round her. Then she flung her arms round Fanny, just as if she had never said all those things about her. But this was not all. Letty and Mrs. Fairfax came through the cupboard after Martha, carrying a hamper between them, and after them came Percival, who looked livelier than Sophie had ever seen him. We came over by carrier at first light, Mrs. Fairfax said, and we brought... Bless me, it's Fanny! She dropped her end of the hamper and ran to hug Fanny. Letty dropped her end and ran to hug Sophie. In fact, there was such general hugging and exclaiming and shouting that Sophie thought it was a marvel how did not wake up but she could hear him snoring even through the shouting. I shall have to leave this evening, she thought. She was too glad to see everyone to consider going before that. Letty was very fond of Percival. While Michael carried the hamper to the bench and unpacked cold chickens and wines and honey puddings from it, Letty hung on to Percival's arm in an owner-like way, that Sophie could not quite approve of, and made him tell her all that he remembered. Percival didn't seem to mind. Letty looked so lovely that Sophie didn't blame him. He just arrived and kept turning into a man and then into different dogs and insisting that he knew me, Letty said to Sophie. I knew I'd never seen him before, but it didn't matter. She patted Percival's shoulders if he was still a dog. But you had met Prince Justin, Sophie said. Oh, yes, Letty said offhandedly. Mind you, he was in disguise in a green uniform, but it was obviously him. He was so smooth and courtly, even when he was annoyed about the finding spells. I had to make him up two lots because they would keep showing that Wizard Solomon was somewhere between us and Market Chipping, and he swore that couldn't be true. And all the time I was doing them, he kept interrupting me, calling me Sweet Lady in a sarcastic sort of way, and asking me who I was and where my family lived and how old I was. I thought it was cheek. I'd rather have Wizard Howl, and that's saying something. By this time, everyone was milling about, eating chicken and sipping wine. Calcifer seemed to be shy. He had gone down to green flickers, and nobody seemed to notice him. Sophie wanted him to meet Letty. She tried to coax him out. "'Is that really the demon who has charge of Hal's life?' Letty said, looking down at the green flickers rather disbelievingly. Sophie looked up to assure Letty that Calcifer was real and saw Miss Angorian standing by the door, looking shy and uncertain. Oh, do excuse me, I've come at a bad time, haven't I? Miss Angorian said, I just wanted to talk to Howell. Sophie stood up, not quite sure what to do. She was ashamed of the way she had driven Miss Angorian out before. It was only because she knew Howell was courting Miss Angorian. On the other hand, that did not mean she had to like her. Michael took things out of Sophie's hands by greeting Miss Angorian with a beaming smile and a shout of welcome. "'How's asleep at the moment?' he said. "'Come and have a glass of wine while you wait.' "'How kind,' said Miss Angorian. But it was plain that Miss Angorian was not happy. She refused wine and wandered nervously about, nibbling at a leg of chicken. 
The room was full of people who all knew one another very well, and she was the outsider. Fanny didn't help by turning from non-stop talk with Mrs. Fairfax and saying, What peculiar clothes! Martha didn't help either. She had seen how admiringly Michael greeted Miss Angorian. She went and made sure that Michael didn't talk to anyone but herself and Sophie, and Letty ignored Miss Angorian and went to sit on the stairs with Percival. Miss Angorian seemed rather quickly to decide that she had had enough. Sophie saw her at the door trying to open it. She hurried over, feeling very guilty. After all, Miss Angorian must have felt very strongly about how to have come here at all. Please don't go yet, Sophie said. I'll go and wake Howl up. Oh, no, you mustn't do that, Miss Angorian said, smiling nervously. I've got the day off, and I'm quite happy to wait. I thought I'd go and explore outside. It's rather stuffy in here with that funny green fire burning. This seemed to Sophie the perfect way to get rid of Miss Angorian without really getting rid of her. She politely opened the door for her. Somehow, maybe it had to do with the defences Howell had asked Michael to keep up. The knob had got turned round to purple down. Outside was a misty blaze of sun and the drifting banks of red and purple flowers. What gorgeous rhododendrons! Miss Angorian exclaimed in her huskiest and most throbbing voice. I must look! She sprang eagerly down into the marshy grass. Don't go toward the southeast! Sophie called after her. The castle was drifting off sideways. Miss Angorian buried her beautiful face in a cluster of white flowers. I won't go far at all, she said. Good gracious, Fanny said, coming up behind Sophie. Whatever has happened to my carriage? Sophie explained as far as she could, but Fanny was so worried that Sophie had to turn the door orange down and open it to show the mansion drive in a much greyer day where the footman and Fanny's coachman were sitting on the roof of the carriage eating cold sausage and playing cards. Only then would Fanny believe that her carriage had not been mysteriously spirited away. Sophie was trying to explain, without really knowing herself, how one door could open on several different places, when Calcifer surged up from his logs, roaring, Howl! he roared, filling the chimney with blue flame. Howl! Howell Jenkins! The witch has found your sister's family! There were two violent thumps overhead. Howell's bedroom door crashed, and Howell came tearing downstairs. Letty and Percival were hurled out of his way. Fanny screamed faintly at the sight of him. Howell's hair was like a haystack, and there were red rims round his eyes. Got me on my weak flank, blaster! He shouted as he shot across the room with his black sleeves flying. I was afraid she would! Thanks, Calcifer. He shoved Fanny aside and hurled open the door. Sophie heard the door bang behind Howl as she hobbled upstairs. She knew it was nosy, but she had to see what happened. As she hobbled through Howl's bedroom, she heard everyone else following her. What a filthy room, Fanny exclaimed. Sophie looked out of the window. It was drizzling in the neat garden. The swing was hung with drops. The witch's waving mane of red hair was all dewed with it. She stood leaning against the swing, tall and commanding in her red robes, beckoning and beckoning again. Howell's niece Mary was shuffling over the wet grass toward the witch. She did not look as if she wanted to go, but she seemed to have no choice. Behind her, Howell's nephew Neil was shuffling toward the witch even more slowly, glowering in his most ferocious way and Howell's sister Megan was behind the two children. Sophie could see Megan's arms gesturing and Megan's mouth opening and shutting. She was clearly giving the witch a piece of her mind, but she was being drawn toward the witch too. Howell burst out onto the lawn. He had not bothered to alter his clothes. He did not bother to do any magic. He just charged straight at the witch. The witch made a grab for Mary, but Mary was still too far away. Howl got to Mary first, slung her behind him, and charged on, and the witch ran. 
She ran like a cat with a dog after it, across the lawn and over the neat fence, in a flurry of flame-coloured robes with howl like the chasing dog a foot or so behind and closing. The witch vanished over the fence in a red blur. Howl went after her in a black blur with trailing sleeves. Then the fence hid both of them from sight. I hope he catches her, said Martha. The little girl's crying. Down below, Megan put her arm round Mary and took both children indoors. There was no knowing what had happened to Howl and the witch. Letty and Percival and Martha and Michael went back downstairs. Fanny and Mrs. Fairfax were transfixed with disgust at the state of Howell's bedroom. Look at those spiders, Mrs. Fairfax said. And the dust on these curtains, said Fanny. Annabel, I saw some brooms in that passage you came through. Let's get them, said Mrs. Fairfax. I'll pin that dress up for you, Fanny, and we'll get to work. I can't bear a room to be in this state. Oh, poor Hal, Sophie thought. He does love those spiders. She hovered on the stairs, wondering how to stop Mrs. Fairfax and Fanny. From downstairs, Michael called, Sophie, we're going to look round the mansion. Want to come? That seemed the ideal thing to stop the two ladies from cleaning. Sophie called to Fanny and hobbled hurriedly downstairs. Letty and Percival were already opening the door. Letty had not listened when Sophie explained it to Fanny, and it was clear that Percival did not understand either. Sophie saw they were opening it purple down by mistake. They got it open as Sophie hobbled across the room to put them right. The scarecrow loomed up in the doorway against the flowers. Shut it! Sophie screamed. She saw what had happened. She had actually helped the scarecrow last night by telling it to go ten times as fast. It had simply sped to the castle entrance and tried to get in there. But Miss Angorian was out there. Sophie wondered if she was lying in the bushes in a dead faint. No, don't, she said weakly. No one was attending to her anyway. Letty's face was the colour of Fanny's dress, and she was clutching Martha. Percival was standing staring, and Michael was trying to catch the skull, which was yattering its teeth so hard that it was threatening to fall off the bench and take a wine bottle with it. And the skull seemed to have a strange effect on the guitar, too. It was giving out long, humming twangs. Nom, harum, nom, harum. Calcifer flamed up the chimney again. The thing is speaking, he said to Sophie. It is saying it means no harm. I think it is speaking the truth. It is waiting for your permission to come in. Certainly the scarecrow was just standing there. It was not trying to barge inside as it had before. And Calcifer must have trusted it. He had stopped the castle moving. Sophie looked at the turnip face and the fluttering rags. It was not so frightening after all. She had once had fellow feeling for it. She rather suspected that she had just made it into a convenient excuse for not leaving the castle, because she had really wanted to stay. Now there was no point. Sophie had to leave anyway. Hal preferred Miss Angorian. Please come in, she said a little croakily. Um, said the guitar. The scarecrow surged into the room with one powerful sideways hop. It stood, swinging about on its one leg, as if it was looking for something. The smell of flowers it had brought in with it did not hide its own smell of dust and rotting turnip. The skull yattered under Michael's fingers again. The scarecrow spun round gladly and fell sideways toward it. Michael made one attempt to rescue the skull and then got hastily out of the way, for as the scarecrow fell across the bench, there came the fizzing jolt of strong magic, and the skull melted into the scarecrow's turnip head. It seemed to get inside the turnip and fill it out. There was now a strong suggestion of a rather craggy face on the turnip. The trouble was, it was on the back of the scarecrow. The scarecrow gave a wooden scramble, hopped upright uncertainly, and then swiftly spun its body round. 
so that the front of it was under the craggy turnip face. Slowly, it eased its outstretched arms down to its sides. Now I can speak, it said in a somewhat mushy voice. I may faint, Fanny announced on the stairs. Nonsense, Mrs. Fairfax said behind Fanny. The thing's only a magician's golem. It has to do what it was sent to do. They're quite harmless. Letty all the same looked ready to faint, but the only one who did faint was Percival. He flopped to the floor quite quietly and lay curled up as if he were asleep. Letty, in spite of her terror, ran toward him, only to back away, as the scarecrow gave another hop and stood itself in front of Percival. This is one of the parts I was sent to find, it said in its mushy voice. It swung on its stick until it was facing Sophie. I must thank you, it said. My skull was far away, and I ran out of strength before I reached it. I would have lain in that hedge forever if you'd not come and talked life into me. It swiveled to Mrs. Fairfax and then to Letty. I thank you both, too, it said. Who sent you? What are you supposed to do? Sophie said. The scarecrow swung about uncertainly. More than this, it said. There are still parts missing. Everyone waited, most of them too shaken to speak, while the scarecrow rotated this way and that, seemingly thinking. What is Percival a part of? Sophie said. Let it collect itself, said Calcifer. No one's asked it to explain itself bef He suddenly stopped speaking and shrank until barely a green flame showed. Michael and Sophie exchanged alarmed glances. Then a new voice spoke out of nowhere. It was enlarged and muffled as if it was speaking in a box, but it was unmistakably the voice of the witch. Michael Fisher, it said, tell your master how that he fell for my decoy. I now have the woman called Lillian Gorian in my fortress in the waste. Tell him I will only let her go if he comes himself to fetch her. Is that clear, Michael Fisher? The scarecrow whirled round and hopped for the open door. Oh, no! Michael cried out. Stop it! The witch must have sent it so that she could get in here. Chapter 21 In which a contract is concluded before witnesses. Most people ran after the scarecrow. Sophie ran the other way through the broom cupboard and into the shop, grabbing her stick as she went. This is my fault, she muttered. I have a genius for doing things wrong. I could have kept Miss Angorian indoors. I only needed to talk to her politely, poor thing. Hal may have forgiven me a lot of things, but he's not going to forgive me for this in a hurry. In the flower shop, she hauled the seven-league boots out of the window display and emptied hibiscus roses and water out of them onto the floor. She unlocked the shop door and towed the wet boots out onto the crowded pavement. Excuse me, she said to various shoes and trailing sleeves that were walking in her way. She looked up at the sun, which was not easy to find in the cloudy grey sky. Let's see, south, east, that way. Excuse me, excuse me, she said clearing a small space for the boots among the holidaymakers. She put them down, pointing the right way. Then she stepped into them and began to stride. Zip-zip! 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 It was as quick as that, and even more blurred and breathless in both boots than in one. Sophie had brief glimpses between long double strides of the mansion down at the end of the valley, gleaming between trees, with Fanny's carriage at the door, a bracken on a hillside, of a small river racing down into a green valley, of the same river sliding in a much broader valley, of the same valley turned so wide it seemed endless and blue in the distance, and a towery pile far, far off 
that might have been Kingsbury, of the plain narrowing toward mountains again, of a mountain which slanted so steeply under her boot that she stumbled in spite of her stick, which stumble brought her to the edge of a deep blue-misted gorge with the tops of trees far below where she had to take another stride or fall in, and she landed on crumbly yellow sand. She dug her stick in and looked carefully round. Behind her right shoulder, some miles off, a white steamy mist almost hit the mountains she had just zipped through. Below the mist was a band of dark green. Sophie nodded. Though she could not see the moving castle this far away, she was sure the mist marked the place of flowers. She took another careful stride. Zip! It was fearsomely hot. The clay-yellow sand stretched in all directions now, shimmering in the heat. Rocks lay about in a messy way. The only growing things were occasional dismal grey bushes. The mountains looked like clouds coming up on the horizon. If this is the waste, Sophie said with sweat running in all her wrinkles, then I feel sorry for the witch having to live here. She took another stride. The wind of it did not cool her down at all. The rocks and bushes were the same, but the sand was greyer and the mountains seemed to have sunk down the sky. Sophie peered into the quivering grey glare ahead, where she thought she could see something rather higher than rock. She took one more stride. Now it was like an oven, but there was a peculiar shaped pile about a quarter of a mile off, standing on a slight rise in the rock-littered land. It was a fantastical shape of twisted little towers rising to one main tower that pointed slightly askew, like a knotty old finger. Sophie climbed out of the boots. It was too hot to carry anything so heavy, so she trudged off to investigate with only her stick. The thing seemed to be made of the yellow-grey grit of the waist. At first, Sophie wondered if it might be some strange kind of ant's nest. But as she got nearer, she could see that it was as if something had fused together thousands of grainy yellow flower pots into a tapering heap. She grinned. The moving castle had often struck her as being remarkably like the inside of a chimney. This building was really a collection of chimney pots. It had to be a fire demon's work. As Sophie panted up the rise, there was suddenly no doubt that this was the witch's fortress. Two small orange figures came out of a dark space at the bottom and stood waiting for her. She recognised the witch's two page boys. Hot and breathless as she was, she tried to speak to them politely, to show she had no quarrel with them. Good afternoon, she said. They just gave her sulky looks. One bowed and held out his hand, pointing toward the misshapen dark archway between the bent columns of chimney pots. Sophie shrugged and followed him inside. The other page walked after her. And, of course, the entrance vanished as soon as she was through. Sophie shrugged again. She would have to deal with that problem when she came back. She rearranged her lace shawl, straightened her draggled skirts, and walked forward. It was a little like going through the castle door with the knob back down. There was a moment of nothingness, followed by murky light. The light came from greenish-yellow flames that burned and flickered all round, but in a shadowy way, which gave no heat and very little light either. When Sophie looked at them, the flames were never where she was looking, but always to the side. But that was the way of magic. Sophie shrugged again and followed the page this way and that among skinny pillars of the same chimney-pot kind as the rest of the building. At length, the pages led her to a sort of central den. Or maybe it was just a space between pillars. Sophie was confused by then. The fortress seemed enormous, though she suspected that it was deceptive, just as the castle was. The witch was standing there waiting. Again, it was hard to tell how Sophie knew, except that it could be no one else. The witch was hugely tall and skinny now, and her hair was fair in a rope-like pigtail over one bony shoulder. She wore a white dress. 
When Sophie walked straight up to her, brandishing her stick, the witch backed away. I am not to be threatened, the witch said, sounding tired and frail. Then give me Miss Angorian and you won't be, said Sophie. I'll take her and go away. The witch backed away further, gesturing with both hands, and the page boys both melted into sticky orange blobs, which rose into the air and flew towards Sophie. Yucky, get off! Sophie cried, beating at them with her stick. The orange blobs did not seem to care for her stick. They dodged it and wove about and then darted behind Sophie. She was just thinking she had got the better of them when she found herself glued to a chimney pot pillar by them. Orange sticky stuff stranded between her ankles when she tried to move and plucked at her hair quite painfully. I'd almost rather have green slime, Sophie said. I hope those weren't real boys. Only emanations, said the witch. Let me go, said Sophie. No, said the witch. She turned away and seemed to lose interest in Sophie entirely. Sophie began to fear that, as usual, she had made a mess of things. The sticky stuff seemed to be getting harder and more elastic every second. When she tried to move, it snapped her back against the pottery pillar. Where's Miss Angorian? she said. You will not find her, said the witch. We will wait until Howl comes. He's not coming, said Sophie. He's got more sense, and your curse hasn't all worked anyway. It will, said the witch, smiling slightly. Now that you have fallen for our deception and come here, Howl will have to be honest for once. She made another gesture toward the murky flames this time, and a sort of throne trundled out from between two pillars and stopped in front of the witch. There was a man sitting in it, wearing a green uniform and long, shiny boots. Sophie thought he was asleep at first, with his head out of sight sideways. But the witch gestured again. The man sat up straight, and he had no head on his shoulders at all. Sophie realised she was looking at all that was left of Prince Justin. If I was Fanny, Sophie said, I'd threaten to faint. Put his head back on at once. He looks terrible like that. I disposed of both heads months ago, said the witch. I sold Wizard Solomon's skull when I sold his guitar. Prince Justin's head is walking around somewhere with the other leftover parts. This body is a perfect mixture of Prince Justin and Wizard Solomon. It's waiting for Howl's head to make it our perfect human. When we have Howl's head, we shall have the new King of Ingery, and I shall rule as Queen. You're mad, Sophie said. You've no right to make jigsaws of people, and I shouldn't think Howl's head will do a thing you want. It'll slither out somehow. Howl will do exactly as we say, the witch said with a sly, secretive smile. We shall control his fire demon. Sophie realised she was very scared indeed. She knew she had made a mess of things now. Where is Miss Angorian? she said, waving her stick. The witch did not like Sophie to wave her stick. She stepped backward. I am very tired, she said. You people keep spoiling my plans. First Wizard Solomon would not come near the waist, so that I had to threaten Princess Valeria in order to make the king order him out here. Then, when he came, he grew trees. Then the king would not let Prince Justin follow Solomon for months. And when he did follow, the silly fool went up north somewhere for some reason, and I had to use all my arts to get him here. Howl has caused me even more trouble. He got away once. I've had to use a curse to bring him in. And while I was finding out enough about him to lay the curse, you got into what was left of Solomon's brain and caused me more trouble. And now when I bring you here, you wave your stick and argue. I've worked very hard for this moment, and I am not to be argued with. She turned away and wandered off into the murk. Sophie stared after the tall white figure moving among the dim flames. 
I think her age has caught up with her, she thought. She's crazy. I must get loose and rescue Miss Angorian from her somehow. Remembering that the orange stuff had avoided her stick, just as the witch had, Sophie reached back over her shoulders with her stick and wagged it back and forth where the sticky stuff met the pottery pillar. Get out of it, she said. Let me go. Her hair dragged painfully, but stringy orange bits began to fly away sideways. Sophie wagged the stick harder. She had worked her head and shoulders loose when there came a dull, booming sound. The pale flames wavered and the pillar behind Sophie shook. Then, with a crash like a thousand tea sets falling downstairs, a piece of the fortress wall blew out. Light blinded in through a long, jagged hole, and a figure came leaping in through the opening. Sophie turned eagerly, hoping it was Howl, but the black outline had only one leg. It was the scarecrow again. The witch gave a yowl of rage and rushed toward it with her fair pigtail flying and her bony arms stretched out. The scarecrow leaped at her. There was another violent bang, and the two of them were wrapped in a magic cloud like the cloud over Port Haven when Howl and the witch had fought. The cloud battered this way and that, filling the dusty air with shrieks and booms. Sophie's hair frizzed. The cloud was only yards away, going this way and that among pottery pillars, and the break in the wall was quite near, too. As Sophie had thought, the fortress was really not big. Every time the cloud moved across the blinding white gap, she could see through it and see the two skinny figures battling in its midst. She stared and kept wagging her stick behind her back. She was loose, all except her legs, when the cloud streamed across in front of the light one more time. Sophie saw another person leap through the gap behind it. This one had flying black sleeves. It was Howl. Sophie could see the outline of him clearly, standing with his arms folded, watching the battle. For a moment it looked as if he was going to let the witch and the scarecrow get on with it. Then the long sleeves flapped as Howl raised his arms. Above the screaming and booming, Howl's voice shouted one strange, long word, and a long roll of thunder came with it. The scarecrow and the witch both jolted. Claps of sound rang round the pottery pillars, echo after echo, and each echo carried some of the cloud of magic away with it. It vanished in wisps and swirled away in murky eddies. When it had become the thinnest white haze, the tall figure with the pigtail began to totter. The witch seemed to fold in on herself, thinner and whiter than ever. Finally, as the haze faded clean away, she fell in a heap with a small clatter. As the million soft echoes died, Howl and the Scarecrow were left thoughtfully facing one another across a pile of bones. Good, thought Sophie. She slashed her legs free and went across to the headless figure in the throne. It was getting on her nerves. No, my friend, Howl said to the Scarecrow. The Scarecrow had hopped right among the bones and was pushing them this way and that with its leg. No, you won't find her heart here. Her fire demon will have got that. I think it's had the upper hand of her for a long time now. Sad, really. As Sophie took off her shawl and arranged it decently across Prince Justin's headless shoulders, Howell said, I think the rest of what you were looking for is over here. He walked toward the throne with the scarecrow hopping beside him. Typical, he said to Sophie. I break my neck to get here and I find you peacefully tidying up. Sophie looked up at him. As she had feared, the hard black and white daylight coming through the broken wall showed her that Howl had not bothered to shave or tidy his hair. His eyes were still red-rimmed and his black sleeves were torn in several places. There was not much to choose between Howl and the Scarecrow. Oh dear, Sophie thought. He must love Miss Angorian very much. I came for Miss Angorian, she explained. And I thought if I arranged for your family to visit you, it would keep you quiet for once, Howl said disgustedly. But no. Here the scarecrow hopped in front of Sophie. I was sent by Wizard Solomon, it said in its mushy voice. 
I was guarding his bushes from the birds in the waste when the witch caught him. He cast all of his magic that he could spare on me and had ordered me to come to his rescue. But the witch had taken him to pieces by then, and the pieces were in various places. It has been a hard task. If you had not come and talked me to life again, I would have failed. It was answering the question Sophie had asked it before they both rushed off. So when Prince Justin ordered finding spells, they must have kept pointing to you, she said. Why was that? To me, or to his skull, said the Scarecrow. Between us, we are the best part of him. And Percival is made of Wizard Solomon and Prince Justin, Sophie said. She was not sure Letty was going to like this. The Scarecrow nodded its craggy turnip face. Both parts told me that the witch and her fire demon were no longer together and I could defeat the witch on her own, it said. I thank you for giving me ten times my former speed. Hal waved it aside. Bring that body with you to the castle, he said. I'll sort you out there. Sophie and I have to get back before that fire demon finds a way of getting inside my defences. He took hold of Sophie's skinny wrist. Come on, where are those seven-league boots? Sophie hung back. But, Miss Angorian... Don't you understand? Hal said, dragging at her. Miss Angorian is the fire demon. If it gets inside the castle, then Calcifer's had it, and so have I. Sophie put both hands over her mouth. I knew I'd made a mess of it. She said, it's been in twice already, but she, it went out. Oh, Lord, groaned Hal. Did it touch anything? The guitar, Sophie admitted. Then it's still in there, said Hal. Come on. He pulled Sophie over to the smashed wall. Follow us carefully, he shouted back to the scarecrow. I'm going to have to raise a wind. No time to look for those boots he said to Sophie as they climbed over the jagged edges into the hot sunlight. Just run and keep running, or I won't be able to move you. Sophie helped herself along with her stick and managed to break into a hobbling run, stumbling among the stones. Hal ran beside her, pulling her. Wind leapt up, whistling, then roaring, hot and gritty, and grey sand climbed around them in a storm that pinged on the pottery fortress. By that time, they were not running but skimming forward in a sort of slow-motion lope. The stony ground sped past underneath. Dust and grit thundered around them, high overhead and streaming far away behind. It was very noisy and not at all comfortable, but the waste rocketed past. It's not Calcifer's fault, Sophie yelled. I told him not to say. He wouldn't, anyway, Hal shouted back. I knew he'd never give away a fellow fire demon. It was always my weakest flank. I thought Wales was, Sophie screamed. No, I left that deliberately, Hal bellowed. I knew I'd be angry enough to stop her if she tried anything there. I had to leave her an opening, see? The only chance I had of coming at Prince Justin was to use that curse she'd put on me to get near her. So you were going to rescue the prince, Sophie shouted. Why did you pretend to run away? To deceive the witch? Not likely, Howell yelled. I am a coward. Only way I can do something this frightening is to tell myself I'm not doing it. Oh, dear, Sophie thought, looking round at the swirling grit. He's being honest, and this is a wind. The last bit of the curse has come true. The hot grit hit her thunderously, and Hal's grip hurt. Keep running, Hal bawled. You'll get hurt at this speed. Sophie gasped and made her legs work again. She could see the mountains clearly now and a line of green below that was the flowering bushes. Even though yellow sand kept swirling in the way, the mountains seemed to grow, and the green line rushed toward them until it was hedge-high. All my flanks were weak, 
Hal shouted. I was relying on Solomon being alive. Then when all that seemed to be left of him was Parsifal, I was so scared I had to go out and get drunk. And then you go and play into the witch's hands. I'm the eldest, Sophie shrieked. I'm a failure. Garbage, Hal shouted. You just never stop to think. Hal was slowing down. Dust kicked up round them in dense clouds. Sophie only knew the bushes were quite near because she could hear the rush and rattle of the gritty wind in the leaves. They plunged in among them with a crash, still going so fast that Howl had to swerve and drag Sophie in a long, skimming run across a lake. And you're too nice, he added, above the lap-lap of the water and the patter of sand on the water-lily leaves. I was relying on you being too jealous to let that demon near the place. They hit the steamy shore at a slow run. The bushes on either side of the green lane thrashed and heaved as they passed, throwing birds and petals into a whirlwind behind them. The castle was drifting swiftly down the lane toward them, with its smoke streaming back in the wind. Howl slowed down enough to crush the door open and shot Sophie and himself inside. Michael, he shouted. It wasn't me who let the scarecrow in. Michael said guiltily. Everything seemed to be normal. Sophie was surprised to discover what a short time she had really been away. Someone had pulled her bed out from under the stairs, and Percival was lying on it, still unconscious. Letty and Martha and Michael were gathered round it. Overhead, Sophie could hear Mrs. Fairfax's voice and Fanny's, combined with ominous swishings and thumpings that suggested that Howell's spiders were having a hard time. Howell let go of Sophie and dived toward the guitar. Before he could touch it, it burst with a long, melodious boom. Strings flailed. Splinters of wood showered Howell. He was forced to back away with one tattered sleeve over his face. And Miss Angorian was suddenly standing beside the hearth, smiling. Howell had been right. She must have been in the guitar all this time, waiting for her moment. Your witch is dead, Hal said to her. Isn't that too bad, Miss Angorian said, quite unconcerned. Now I can make myself a new human who will be much better. The curse is fulfilled. I can lay hands on your heart now. And she reached down into the grate and plucked Calcifer out of it. Calcifer wobbled on top of her clenched fist, looking terrified. Nobody move, Miss Angorian said warningly. Nobody dared stir. Howl stood stillest of all. Help, Calcifer said weakly. Nobody can help you, said Miss Angorian. You are going to help me control my new human. Let me show you. I have only to tighten my grip. Her hand that was holding Calcifer squeezed until its knuckles showed pale yellow. Howl and Calcifer both screamed. Calcifer beat this way and that in agony. Howl's face turned bluish and he crashed to the floor like a tree falling where he lay as unconscious as Percival. Sophie didn't think he was breathing. Miss Angorian was astonished. She stared at Howl. He's faking, she said. No, he's not, Calcifer screamed, twisted into a writhing spiral shape. His heart's really quite soft. Let go. Sophie raised her stick, slowly and gently. This time she thought for an instant before she acted. Stick, she muttered. Beat Miss Angorian, but don't hurt anyone else. Then she swung the stick and hit Miss Angorian's tight knuckles the biggest crack she could. 
Miss Angorian let out a squealing hiss like a wet log burning and dropped Calcifer. Poor Calcifer rolled helplessly on the floor, flaming sideways across the flagstones and roaring huskily with terror. Miss Angorian raised her foot to stamp on him. Sophie had to let go of her stick and dive to rescue Calcifer. Her stick, to her surprise, hit Miss Angorian again on its own and again and again. But of course it would, Sophie thought. She had talked life into that stick. Mrs. Pentstemon had told her so. Miss Angorian hissed and staggered. Sophie stood up, holding Calcifer, to find her stick drubbing away at Miss Angorian and smoking with the heat of her. By contrast, Calcifer did not seem very hot. He was milky blue with shock. Sophie could feel that the dark lump of Hal's heart was only beating very faintly between her fingers. It had to be Hal's heart she was holding. He had given it away to Calcifer as his part of the contract to keep Calcifer alive. He must have been sorry for Calcifer, but all the same, what a silly thing to do. Fanny and Mrs. Fairfax hurried through the door from the stairs carrying brooms. The sight of them seemed to convince Miss Angorian that she had failed. She ran for the door, with Sophie's stick hovering over her, still clouting at her. Stop her! Sophie shouted. Don't let her get out. Guard all the doors. Everyone raced to obey. Mrs. Fairfax put herself in the broom cupboard with her broom raised. Fanny stood on the stairs. Letty jumped up and guarded the door to the yard, and Martha stood by the bathroom. Michael ran for the castle door, but Percival leaped up off the bed and ran for the door too. His face was white and his eyes were shut, but he ran even faster than Michael. He got there first, and he opened the door. With Calcifer so helpless, the castle had stopped moving. Miss Angorian saw the bushes standing still in the haze outside and raced for the door with inhuman speed. Before she reached it, it was blocked by the scarecrow looming up with Prince Justin hung across its shoulders, still draped in Sophie's lace shawl. It spread its stick arms across the door, barring the way. Miss Angorian backed away from it. The stick beating at her was on fire now. Its metal end was glowing. Sophie realized it could not last much longer. Luckily, Miss Angorian hated it so much that she seized hold of Michael and dragged him in its way. The stick had been told not to hurt Michael. It hovered, flaming. Martha dashed up and tried to pull Michael away. The stick had to avoid her, too. Sophie had got it wrong as usual. There was no time to waste. Calcifer, Sophie said, I shall have to break your contract. Will it kill you? It would, if anyone else broke it, Calcifer said hoarsely. That's why I asked you to do it. I could tell you could talk life into things. Look what you did for the scarecrow and the skull. Then have another thousand years, Sophie said, and willed very hard as she said it, in case just talking was not enough. This had been worrying her very much. She took hold of Calcifer and carefully nipped him off the black lump just as she would nip a dead bud off a stalk. Calcifer whirled loose and hovered by her shoulder as a blue teardrop. I feel so light, he said. Then it dawned on him what had happened. I'm free, he shouted. He whirled to the chimney and plunged up it out of sight. I'm free! Sophie heard him shout overhead faintly as he came out through the chimney pot of the hat shop. Sophie turned to Hal with the almost dead black lump, feeling doubtful in spite of her hurry. She had to get this right, and she was not sure how you did. Well, here goes, she said. Kneeling down beside Hal, she carefully put the black lump on his chest in the leftish sort of place she had felt hers in when it troubled her and pushed. Go in, she told it. Get in there and work. And she pushed and pushed. The heart began to sink in and to beat more strongly as it went. Sophie tried to ignore the flames and scuffles by the door and to keep up a steady, firm pressure. Her hair kept getting in her way. It fell across her face in reddish, fair hanks, but she tried to ignore that too. She pushed. The heart went in. As soon as it had disappeared, Howl stirred about. He gave a loud groan and rolled over onto his face. Hal's 
teeth, he said. I've got a hangover. No. You hit your head on the floor, Sophie said. Hal rose up on his hands and knees with a scramble. I can't stay, he said. I've got to rescue that fool Sophie. I'm here, Sophie said, shaking his shoulder. But so is Miss Angorian. Get up and do something about her, quickly. The stick was entirely flames by now. Martha's hair was frizzling, and it had dawned on Miss Angorian that the scarecrow would burn. She was manoeuvring to get the hovering stick into the doorway. As usual, Sophie thought, I didn't think it through. Hal only needed to take one look. He stood up in a hurry. He held out one hand and spoke a sentence of those words that lost themselves in claps of thunder. Plaster fell from the ceiling. Everything trembled, but the stick vanished, and Hal stepped back with a small, hard, black thing in his hand. It could have been a lump of cinder, except that it was the same shape as the thing Sophie had just pushed into Hal's chest. Miss Angorian whined like a wet fire and held out her arms imploringly. I am afraid not, Hal said. You have had your time. By the look of this, you were trying to get a new heart, too. You were going to take my heart and let Calcifer die, weren't you? He held the black thing between both palms and pushed his hands together. The witch's old heart crumbled into black sand and soot and nothing. Miss Angorian faded away as it crumbled. As Howl opened his hands empty, the doorway was empty of Miss Angorian too. Another thing happened as well. The moment Miss Angorian was gone, the scarecrow was no longer there either. If Sophie had cared to look, she would have seen two tall men standing in the doorway smiling at one another. The one with the craggy face had ginger hair. The one with the green uniform had vaguer features and a lace shawl draped round the shoulders of his uniform. But Howl turned to Sophie just then. Grey doesn't really suit you, he said. I thought that when I first saw you. Calcifer's gone, Sophie said. I had to break your contract. Howl looked a little sad, but he said, we were both hoping you would. Neither of us wanted to end up like the witch or Miss Angorian. Would you call your hair ginger? Red gold, Sophie said. Not much had changed about Howl that she could see. Now he had his heart back, except maybe that his eyes seemed a deeper color, more like eyes and less like glass marbles. Unlike some people's, she said, it's natural. I've never seen why people put such value on things being natural, Hal said, and Sophie knew then that he was scarcely changed at all. If Sophie had had any attention to spare, she would have seen Prince Justin and Wizard Solomon shaking hands and clapping one another delightedly on the back. I'd better get back to my royal brother, Prince Justin said. He walked up to Fanny as the most likely person, and made her a deep, courtly bow. Am I addressing the lady of this house? Uh, not really, Fanny said, trying to hide her broom behind her back. The lady of the house is Sophie. Or will be shortly, Mrs. Fairfax said, beaming benevolently. Hal said to Sophie, I've been wondering all along if you would turn out to be that lovely girl I met on May Day. Why were you so scared, then? If Sophie had been attending, she would have seen Wizard Solomon go up to Letty. Now he was himself, it was clear that Wizard Solomon was at least as strong-minded as Letty was. Letty looked quite nervous as Solomon loomed craggily over her. It seemed to be the prince's memory I had of you and not my own at all, he said. That's quite all right. Letty said bravely. It was a mistake. But it wasn't, protested Wizard Solomon. Would you let me take you on as a pupil at least? Letty went fiery red at this and did not seem to know what to say. 
That seemed to Sophie to be Letty's problem. She had her own. Hal said, I think we ought to live happily ever after. And she thought he meant it. Sophie knew that living happily ever after with Hal would be a good deal more eventful than any story made it sound, though she was determined to try. It should be hair-raising, added Hal. And you'll exploit me, Sophie said. And then you'll cut up all my suits to teach me, said Hal. If Sophie or Hal had had any attention to spare, they might have noticed that Prince Justin... Wizard Solomon and Mrs. Fairfax were all trying to speak to Howl, and that Fanny, Martha and Letty were plucking at Sophie's sleeves, while Michael was dragging at Howl's jacket. "'That was the neatest use of words of power I ever saw from anyone,' Mrs. Fairfax said. "'I wouldn't have known what to do with that creature. "'As I often say—' "'Sophie,' said Letty, "'I need your advice.' Wizard Howl, said Wizard Solomon, I must apologize for trying to bite you so often. In the normal way, I wouldn't dream of setting teeth in a fellow countryman. Sophie, I think this gentleman is a prince, said Fanny. Sir, said Prince Justin, I believe I must thank you for rescuing me from the witch. Sophie, said Martha, the spell's off you. Did you hear? But Sophie and Howl were holding one another's hands and smiling and smiling, quite unable to stop. Don't bother me now, said Howl. I only did it for the money. Liar, said Sophie. I said, Michael shouted, the Calcifers come back. That did get Howl's attention, and Sophie's too. They looked at the grate, where, sure enough, the familiar blue face was flickering among the logs. You didn't need to do that, Hal said. I don't mind, as long as I can come and go, Calcifer said. Besides, it's raining out there in market shipping. The End You've been listening to Howl's Moving Castle by Diana Wynne-Jones, narrated by Jenny Sterling and directed by Matt Wilson. This book is copyrighted 1986 by Diana Wynne-Jones. This recording is copyrighted 2008 by Recorded Books. And thank you for being a Recorded Books reader.